Okay, it is nine o'clock. Um, we'll, we'll get started. So I'll call this meeting to order of the Golden Rain Foundation Board on March 31st, 2022. Seems amazing we're at that date already. Uh, Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly. Walker. Here. Stumfeld. Here. Hamaji. Here. Hurt. Here. Bentley. Here. Brown. Here. Flaherty. She hasn't arrived yet, but she is on her way. Harrington. Here. Madaraki. Here. And O'Keefe. Here. Okay. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you have copies of the board meet, uh, meeting minutes from February 8th and 24th in your agenda packet. Are there any edits or comments to those? If not, and seeing none, they are approved as submitted. Deborah, thank you very much. And now, um, as I introduce the City of Walnut Creek Mayor Pro Tem, Cindy Selva. Cindy, I want to take a moment to express our great gratitude to you and the City Council for uh, your letter of support for the CON FIRE uh, application uh, grant for $4.9 million to CAL FIRE. Uh, as we discussed at the last board meeting, this is a terrific proposal by CON FIRE for a sheeted fire break that benefits not only Rossmore, but Walnut Creek, Moraga, Lafayette, and uh, your support of that is greatly appreciated. So thank you, Cindy. My pleasure. I'll turn, I'll turn it over to you. So. <clears throat> Thank you and good morning, everyone. I'm Cindy Silva. I have the honor of serving this year as Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Walnut Creek and just as importantly, representing the City Council as liaison to the Rossmore community. And so happy almost April. Tomorrow's April Fool's Day, but nothing I will say today is preemptive of that. Everything I'm going to say is true and factual. So yes, I was going to start by saying the um, city was pleased to send a letter of support for the grant application for the 12 mile Walnut Creek Lafayette shaded fuel buffer. It's an important step toward ensuring or better ensuring protection against potential wildfire in the Rossmore community. And so thank you for initiating and helping us um, to do that letter. Um, we will continue to reach out to CAL FIRE, which is a part of the California Department of of the Office of Emergency Services. And so we will continue to keep in touch on that and we will keep our fingers crossed. I noted when we were looking at the grant that it's not just about wildfires, but it's also about sustainability and drought and protecting our communities from wildfires that subsequently not only endanger lives and create safety hazards, but also with the fuel in these fires, they create green <laughs> that virtually negate anything we're doing on transportation, et cetera. So it's an important um, effort by the state and I hope we'll keep our fingers crossed that our grant application is received well by the state. On that same note, our, um, and I noticed that security manager, Tom Cashin is on today. He is working hard with our city departments on the evacuation drill that will occur on Sunday, May 15th. This is probably not a practice of how to evacuate all 10,000 people, but I'm sure Tom will be telling you more about what it entails and how people can be involved as the days get closer. On the economic development front, um, we're seeing increased activity downtown. One of the things you might have noticed is that Creighton Barrel moved from its space at Broadway Plaza into the former Neiman Marcus space. This is not a permanent move. This is a temporary move as they begin to transition to a different space and a different model of doing business. That's Creighton Barrel. The Creighton Barrel space is now undergoing major tenant renovations to welcome a new business called Pinstripes and that they have establishments on the peninsula. But we finally might get another bowling alley back in Walnut Creek. It has been a number of decades. But Pinstripes is a concept where they have a bowling alley and other um, family style entertainment, as well as restaurants. So it should be a great family draw and an experience based business that helps to drive traffic downtown, not car traffic, but people traffic that is so vital to economic. Um, there is a new restaurant at the corner of Locust and Bonanza that I think opened just before we met the last time in late February. It's called Lita, L-I-T-A. 
and it is a Caribbean style restaurant and it is owned by the same people who own um, Broderick's, which is across the street, which used to be Hubcaps. And now the Hot Boys restaurant, which is spicy chicken um, items that was in the former Mel's diner space. And I would say that finally on the economic development front, the city continues to work on refining our requirements for what will um, be permanent outdoor dining so that we can get that going early to mid to late summer. So the, the temporary and emergency based spaces could be converted to permanent spaces for outdoor dining. The arts and recreation department also encompasses our social services division and they have launched a program to provide accessible and affordable transportation services through the alternative um, shared ride service called Lyft. And if you're interested in those, this is for people with adaptive needs. So it's all ages, but adaptive needs. So many of, the, of your Rossmore residents may qualify for those. And if they're interested about that, I would direct people to the Walnut Creek City website. Upcoming in April for the city council, we will be receiving a presentation on this year's sustainable Contra Costa challenge. And I know many people in Rossmore will be interested in that. Next Tuesday night at our meeting, we will be having the final reading and final hearing on the um, buffer zone proposed at Planned Parenthood on Oakland Boulevard. And in the second meeting in April, we will be having our first hearing on expanding our cannabis delivery services to include all um, adult uses, both recreational and medical. We have begun the um, work on our housing element and workshops are currently underway, public workshops to gather input on what the community perceives are our needs in terms of housing and housing policies. This is a required document that we must do every eight years per the state of California. And the, doc the housing element must also indicate how we will zone to achieve the assigned housing uh, regional housing need allocation numbers, which is the amount of housing we have to plan for for the next eight years. And I will close by saying um, the last time we met, which was February 24th, was also a very significant day on the world front. But two days later, the Bedford Gallery launched a very fortuitous exhibit called Forced to Flee. And it is really about refugees and it's a fabulous art exhibit, and I recommend everyone visit it at the Bedford Gallery, which is on the first floor of the Lesher Center for the Arts. And I am happy to answer any questions, but to say thank you all for your work on behalf of your community. Cindy, thank you. I, I think you should publish a video blog or a newsletter. That was a great report. Any, any questions for uh, Cindy at this point? Don't make it too tough. <laughs> And I can't see everybody right now, so if, just speak up if you have questions. Okay, uh, Dale. Oh. Yes, yes, thank you, Ms. Silva. I, I congratulate the city on encouraging and supporting the variety of businesses that we have here. It, it isn't necessary for us to leave Walnut Creek to go to some other city. Um, to do any shopping so congratulations thank you thank you so much it was a, it's been a long amount of work many decades by many of my predecessors so it's nice to be able to follow in their footsteps and maintain their legacy okay any other questions for cindy cindy i think uh, the city council and the rossmore board should uh, plan a bowling outing that does uh, pinstripes when it opens so well, let's uh, have a, let's have a tournament yeah. All right. You're on. <laughs> we'll probably right there, lose. There. I would assume that the city council would lose. <laughs> well, we'll make some good bets anyway. <laughs> Cindy, thank you very much for that report. Thank and you. Thanks for your support. Okay. I look forward uh, next to hearing up. the rest of the conversation today. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, next up is financial status report to Mary Hurt, treasurer and CFO Joel Lesser. Thank you, President Walker. At the end of February, revenue is under budget by 145,000. 
The major contributors to this unfavorable revenue variance are recreation revenue of $78,000, golf revenue of $23,000, personal training revenue of $19,000, and media revenue of $15,000. Total expenses are also under budget by a total of 321000 The major reasons for this favorable expense variance are unfilled positions, events and excursions at 61000 and water at 64000 Revenue of 5066000 exceeded expenses of 4538000 by a total of 528000 there is a positive, net positive budget variance, revenue less expenses of 176000 through the end of February. And now I'd like to ask Joel Lesher to dive a little deeper into these, this information. Okay, thank you, Mary. That was a, a good overview on the GRF financials. Uh, I'll go over the highlights of the trust and MOD. So uh, the uh, trust beginning uh, cash balance in 2022 was uh, 6 million uh, 256 K. So on a year to date basis, uh, cash additions were $491,000 and cash expenditures were $547,000. So the ending uh, trust cash balance is at uh, $6.2 million. As far as the bank loans, uh, the aggregate for all three uh, loans uh, as of the end of February uh, was 12,456K. For MOD financials, the uh, year to date revenue uh, for the first two months of the year was one, <clears throat> excuse me, 1,743,000. Total expenses were 1,577,000 which leaves a, uh, a surplus of $167,000. And then on the uh, MOD balance sheet, um, cash is uh, just under 1.5 million. Any questions? Any questions for Mary or Joel? Joel, I just wanna say thank you for keeping us in a sound financial condition across all of our entities, operations and MOD and the trust fund. Really appreciate that. Okay. All right. Moving on. Um, so we're going to do the CEO report, but I just want to say something before we go there. Uh, Tim O'Keefe has exemplified the calm port in a storm over two COVID years. And Tim, we, we share it in your desire to no longer see COVID in your CEO report. But I want to express my appreciation for all the good work that you and the entire Rossmore staff has done for our community. We all recognize the stress and disrupt disruption that COVID, the great resignation and other factors have plagued you and your staff. We also recognize the inconveniences and disruptions to residents and ask for their patience as we find our way back to what is now considered to be normalcy. I know that I speak for the board and Rossmore staff when I say we remain committed to the quality of lifestyle that is the hallmark of our Rossmore. And thank you, Tim, for keeping that going. So with that, the CEO report. Thanks, Dwight. All right, uh, let me just pull it up here just one second. So it is hard to believe, but we are now more than two years beyond uh, the first infections that occurred here in the county and two years past the initial shutdown that occurred on March 17th of 2020. Uh, as, as the board knows, and I know a lot of the residents here are aware, the, we were shut down earlier this year for about a month in uh, early January to early February, uh, the indoor facilities, that is. And, um, and that was due, as everybody, I think, hopefully recognizes by now, due to a recommendation by the county public health director in order to keep this community safe, which is 100% of the residents here at risk of uh, contracting and having complications and perhaps even death if they can uh, acquire the disease. So it, it has been nice to see over the last month and a half now, nearly two months, that uh, activities are slowly beginning to come back here into the community. A lot of the indoor meetings, the activities, celebrations, entertainment. Uh, I've seen the parking lots full at times, uh, which is not quite back to normal, but because uh, often gateways, Clubhouse in particular, and, and certainly the event center in Creekside, uh, pre-pandemic, they would nearly be full all the time. 
and we're not quite at that level yet, but it is nice to see some activities and people getting back together again and enjoying themselves. It has been way too long. I, I want to still, though, remind people that the virus is still out there. The, uh, I just checked a few moments ago. I just checked the uh, county's uh, infection and hospitalization data. And what's kind of interesting now at this point is that uh, infection data is probably not as reliable as it had been, say, even for the first 18 months, and maybe almost two years because so many people now are taking home tests and not reporting those results if they, if they test positive. Uh, there was a requirement during their most, throughout most of the pandemic that infections are supposed to be reported to the public health officials. But as I say, I think with a lot of people taking a home test, that likely isn't happening. So the actual infection numbers are probably a lot higher. So the, the metric that is more relevant at this point is to keep an eye on hospitalizations and ICU data uh, because that's a fixed, there's a fixed number of beds in the hospital uh, or in the county in the various hospitals and probably a better indicator of, as to whether or not uh, we're at a stage that is of concern. So I did note this morning that infections for the first time in two months have actually started to go up again. And that's on the numbers that are reported to the county. Um, but not it doesn't look like it's gone up much for people that are vaccinated. It is people who are unvaccinated. So uh, at this stage, uh, I guess that's encouraging for those of us that are vaccinated. And, and again, serves as another reminder for friends and family members that you might know that have, for whatever reason, declined to be vaccinated to just be a reminder that it's still public health is uh, still recommending that, that everybody get vaccinated. Now, the virus that is circulating right now is no longer Omicron. It's actually a variant of Omicron uh, called BA2. Um, again, the numbers that I checked this morning, the World Health Organization globally says that 86% of all global infections now are the BA2 variant. And the CDC announced yesterday that it's just about 55% in the United States. California, I did, couldn't find actual data on California. Uh, I'm sure it's out there. I just couldn't locate it to see what percentage of, of the infections are due to this variant. This particular variant, according to the health officials, is uh, more easily transmissible than Omicron. Omicron was significantly more transmissible than Delta. You remember Delta from last summer, which, which really drove the surge in the summer and early fall of, of last year. If you're vaccinated and you get the virus, um, they say that it is, for most people, it's going to likely just be a bad case of the flu. I spoke with a resident yesterday who told me he and his wife both had um, acquired uh, COVID earlier this year, and he never got a, a fever, never got a temperature, um, but it just he said it felt like a bad case of the flu. So I, I'm sure we all know people at this point who've probably been infected. If you're vaccinated, it, it is not, does not appear to be quite as serious. Uh, but the health uh, officials continue to remind people that or they encourage people to continue wearing masks if you're indoors. If you're in your home with nobody else there, of course, you don't need to wear a mask. But when you're in public spaces or even in uh, GRF's facilities are technically private spaces, but obviously there's, there's a lot of people that, that can gather Still not required to wear a mask, but the health officials encourage you to continue to do that. I want to remind residents that businesses and Golden Rain Foundation clubs may still mandate the wearing of masks or even mandate vaccine verifications. That's um, We've had some people complain about that, but the health orders actually give businesses and, and operators, entities, people that are, you know, uh, gathering people together for whatever reason, um, restaurants, and, and, and this would apply to our clubs as well, that um, they can mandate wearing masks. That can be a requirement in, in order to be admitted into the venue or the space. So um, please don't lash out at the people that are just trying to keep everybody else safe. I, I know it's frustrating, uh, but um, everybody should still have a mask in their pocket just or their purse just in case. Now, as far as whether or not you feel safe getting back together in indoors and public spaces, uh, I would say this. If you're not comfortable or you are not vaccinated 
or you have a compromised immune system, then don't convene, don't get together with people. Even though there might be friends and family members or, or people that you're affiliated with through various clubs, just don't go if you are, for whatever reason, uncomfortable with that. But if you feel like you still want to, just take the additional precautions that the health officials still continue to advise, which is mask, socially distance, and then limit the length of time talking to others. So their standard is that if you are exposed to somebody, if, if, it, if the exposure was longer than 15 minutes within a six foot radius, that's when you are deemed to have been exposed. So if you, and that's not a magic number, that's just kind of the, their best um, guess as to, you know, uh, at what degree of exposure would require you to take additional steps. So um, again, if you're talking with people in a group, in a group setting or a social setting or whatever, um, just limit your exposure to others. Don't talk to somebody for more than about 10 minutes and, and move on. And, you know, the whole idea is around what they call the viral load and how many of these virus spores are in the air. So when you were talking, singing, you know, talking loud, laughing, et cetera, all those things increase the viral load in the air. That's why outdoor activity is more, is, is preferred because um, the environment, the air is circulating a lot better than it is indoors. <clears throat> All right, that's my update on on the pandemic, and hopefully we don't have too many more times where that has to lead off my report, because it does feel like things are getting a little bit better. Uh, the next I wanted to talk about is uh, disrupted operations throughout the organization, and I'm going to start this off with a list, and I'm going to read to you this portion of my report. The temporary elimination of weekend bus service, the very long delay in completing phase one of the Gateway Studios renovation, the long delay in completing the replastering of the hillside pool, a burned out heater in the hot tub at the, at the Tice pool, a broken elevator in one of the mutuals, staffing shortages at the pools, buses, fitness center, administration and maintenance, and the list goes on. I've discussed numerous times in my monthly reports over the last two years, many of the operational challenges created by the pandemic, from the impact of the great resignation to the supply chain shortages, which has affected our ability to acquire equipment and supplies and even toilet paper. The toll that the pandemic has wreaked on the global, national and regional economies has been massively disruptive, inconvenient and costly in both financial and human capital. As much as many people like to think that Rossmore is a beautiful and peaceful paradise, immune to the pressures and issues of the outside world, we are most certainly not. The vast majority of Rossmore residents have weathered the pandemic disruptions very well while anxiously anticipating the return to some form of pre-pandemic normalcy soon, and the sooner the better. But many haven't, and the staffing, equipment, and supply issues persist, and will until the manufacturing and labor crises here and elsewhere abate. Some residents will continue to demand their services or access to facilities and will maintain that GRF is not doing enough or working fast enough to resolve these issues. To be clear, GRF has no control over global manufacturing processes. GRF cannot force people to come here to work. Yet these are both key elements in GRF's delivery of services and programming to Rossmore that prevent us from fully opening or making everything available to residents at the expected pre-pandemic level. The hiring challenges right now are the most difficult I've ever seen in my 39 years in management. And filling our vacancies with inexperienced or unqualified personnel will not make things better. This community does not tolerate inexperience well. Residents want to be served by qualified professionals who know what they are doing. There's little appetite or available funding to train novices in any given field of expertise at GRF. Rossmore has long valued hiring experienced people who cut their teeth elsewhere so that they can hit the ground running here, which brings us full circle to the great challenge of 2022. GRF has experienced more turnover, mostly retirements and resignations, and a small number of involuntary terminations in the last year than the last several years combined. There are many reasons for this. Through the exit interview process throughout 2021, we've learned that several have indicated that it was either time to retire or the pandemic has caused them to reflect and accelerate the retirement date sooner than they had originally planned. This trend has occurred all over the country. A few employees have moved out of California due to the high cost of living. 
This was rarely a cited factor in previous years, but it's not surprising since more and more of our staff live outside of Contra Costa due to the high cost of living, mostly to points north and east of here, resulting in two to three hour daily round trip commutes. Several others have taken advantage of the great resignation and found jobs elsewhere that have either enhanced their professional development and or increased their pay and benefits. So we can't fault them for that. But several have noted that the tipping point and their decision to leave has been the often toxic and disrespectful treatment of staff by residents. Of all the factors noted in this essay, this is one area that is outside of GRF's purview, but entirely within the control of the community. The fact that we have lost high quality qualified personnel during this time of unprecedented regional and national unemployment upheaval due to repeated incidents of mistreatment and disrespect should give all of us pause to consider, consider our respective roles in this. For the first 44 years of Rossmore's existence, the promise of a pension was an enticing benefit, resulting in very low turnover with many staff staying 20, 30, and even more than 40 years here. That pension encouraged staff to stick through the tough times and even tougher residents. But the pension for newly hired non-union staff went away 13 years ago. Nearly two thirds of the staff have been hired since then and to be regularly subjected to personal attacks, accusations, unreasonable expectations, profanity and rudeness is more than many people can handle and not experienced to this degree in almost any other profession. When employees have choices in the current labor market and a perception that the grass is greener on the other side, it becomes tempting to explore those options where the stress level might be significantly less, even if wages and benefits aren't marginally better elsewhere. Now, I don't mean to imply that mistreatment is constant or universal in Rossmore. It is not. The majority of residents here are kind and respectful. I anecdotally tell the staff that it's probably only about three to 5% of the residents in Rossmore that mistreat staff. Certainly it's a relatively small percentage, but 5% of 10,000 residents is still 500 people who on any given day, every day, go on the attack. For staff in frontline roles at the order desk, alterations, member records, fitness center, recreation, lifeguarding, custodial, bus driving, golf maintenance, landscaping, building maintenance, and governance administration. The constant drumbeat of anger, belittling accusations, charges of incompetence, discrimination, harassment, and profanity can be very demoralizing, particularly on the hardworking men and women who operate this community and take pride in their work. This is not a new issue. I'm in my seventh year here, and this has been a recurring problem that existed long before I got here. For whatever reason, the impatience, anger, and vitriol have become markedly worse over these past two years. I hope that by highlighting this issue, residents can take note because we've lost some very talented staff this past year, making it that much more difficult to recruit, hire, train, and restore services and programming to pre-pandemic levels. There's no question that residents and staff alike have experienced trauma these past two years wrought by the pandemic. We're all understandably frustrated with the masking, the closures, the resulting limitations placed on all of our lives by this resilient coronavirus that just hasn't left us alone yet. But this does not justify the mistreatment of staff, nor the governance volunteers on the boards and committees in Rossmore for GRF or the mutuals who've experienced similar treatment. The, experience, uh, the extraordinary staff turnover this past year has been extremely difficult. Services in many areas in Rossmore are curtailed and will continue to be until staffing levels are restored and the global supply chain is back to normal. Economists conjecture that the great resignation phenomenon resulting in staffing turnover will probably with, be with us for a couple more years. The GRF board of directors and senior staff are trying new methods to recruit and retain employees and will continue to explore and evaluate other options until the workforce stabilizes. We thank the community for your continued patience during this very difficult time. So that's, uh, I wanted, I felt like that needed to be said and it's uh, probably overdue, um, but um, we have lost some very, very talented people. And unfortunately that the reason that they've given, some of them have given for leaving uh, was a, a contributing factor was the mistreatment of staff. So I'm going to move on to the Hillside Pool update. Um, as everyone knows, the Hillside Pool has been closed for renovation due to a pool leak. Now, we have known for a couple of years, in fact, in early 2020, we had scheduled 
to replaster the pool. It was it was overdue. It, I think it had been like 20 years since it had been redone. And we knew that there was a leak. When they removed the plaster, they discovered that it was in much worse shape than we had anticipated. There was not one crack. There was multiple cracks running the width of the pool. Um, and if you're familiar with the, the way that pool is set up, the hillside, the namesake hillside, is just on the other side of the swimming pool. And so it's not surprising with the clay soils that we have, which expand and contract with the weather and the rain, and then the drying out in the summertime, that there's going to be cracks in the pool. So it, it, it has become, it was a much larger project than, than was originally anticipated. Now, we didn't do the pool, obviously, in 2020. The pandemic happened. Pools were closed. Then when they were, um, when the county allowed certain things to reopen, outdoor swimming and pools was allowed to reopen. So we postponed the, the plastering work and the repair work. Um, and then as we continued through 2020 and then 2021, as one of the few things that we could continue to do, we continued to postpone then the replastering of the pool, but it really got to the point where we couldn't do it wait any longer. It needed to get done. And it should have been done and completed by the opening of the pool this past March. But like I say, the, the work that was discovered once the plaster was removed um, was, was much larger than anticipated. It required us going out and getting new permits um, and then getting new approvals from the county, from the health department and for the work that needed to be done and finally, uh, also due to the, you know, the great resignation phenomenon, and it isn't affecting just Rossmore, it's everywhere. Every employer has difficulty firing, finding staffing at the moment. So the pools are no exception, the pool contractors. So when they started the work, then because of the additional work that was identified with the additional cracks, the new permits that had to get uh, pulled, they had to go and assign their employees elsewhere. So it took a while for them to come back. They came back on March 18th, about two weeks ago. And so we're expecting the pool to be ready. We're hoping sometime in April. We will uh, post an announcement on the website, uh, in the newspaper, and via Nixel once the Hillside Pool is reopened. So it is, it's forthcoming soon. I also wanted to provide an update on the bus service. The uh, And I've mentioned this before, but... Um, uh, it, and it kind of goes along with my earlier remarks here. We had a series of retirements, resignations, and medical leaves, unfortunately, all happening at the same time this year. Golden Rain lost two-thirds of its bus drivers and had to temporarily discontinue weekend bus service. And the board and the staff recognize that this is a huge imposition and an inconvenience on the residents who rely on our bus service to get around the valley and get to get downtown. <clears throat> but with such a large shortage, uh, with two-thirds of the staff out, uh, we, you can't just put anybody in to drive a bus. You have to be specially certified by the state of California, by the CHP, and uh, requires certain training and licensing. So it's a long process to train, to recruit, and then train and license, and then uh, get drivers out onto the road here. So unfortunately, there's been some residents who have accused the Golden Rain Board and staff of using the weekend closures of the bus service as an excuse to permanently close the bus service. And I want to make this very clear. The board and the staff have absolutely no intention of reducing bus service. It's budgeted for. There's no reason to reduce anything. It is purely the fact that we don't have drivers. We had nine drivers. We have three drivers now. And, and we're unable to continue to provide weekend service. As soon as we get more people on staff, that the, the the various routes and services will resume, including weekend service, but we're not quite there yet. The good news is that we have hired three new drivers. We have two others in the hiring process. So it should be in a few more weeks. We, we do expect to have uh, be able to resume most, if not all, of the bus services. And finally, <clears throat> uh, I've got a list of em employee transitions here. In February, we had seven employees begin their employment with Golden Rain. I think that's a new record. Rodolfo Gonzalez, a carpenter. Cynthia Jonas, a budget analyst in the accounting department. Sherry McDaniels, an accounts payable and receivable specialist in the accounting department. Adam Morales, a lifeguard. And Tracy Johnson and Eric Warren, both bus drivers. Unfortunately, we had four employees leave their employment with Golden Rain in February. Rebecca Pollan, our landscape manager. Lauren Williams, an accounts payable and receivable specialist in the accounting department. John Heist and Renetta Hubler were bus drivers, and they have both left. And that is my report. Thank you, Tim. Any comments, Dale? Yes, uh, I want to 
to reinforce, Tim, what you said about the treatment of employees. Um, expressing displeasure about something can be helpful to hear, but how the displeasure is expressed is important. Disrespect is never appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Dale. Any other questions for Tim? And Tim, the uh, item of civility is on the agenda uh, later uh, in the board meeting. Uh, so we'll be talking about that. Thank you for your report. Our residence forum, Deborah. Hi, yes, we have 11 speakers currently and I'm noting the time 9.35 a.m. And to read the resident forum instructions, residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residence forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented and directors do consider them as a act during the meeting. For Zoom forum instructions, if you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to also type their comments in the Q&A chat feature located in the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residence forum. Please wait your turn and once I'm muted, state your full name and Ross Moore address. Once the forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, and our first speaker handle name is Barbara Landberg. Barbara, I'm allowing you to speak. You have three minutes to address the board. Thank you. Barbara Landberg at 4320 Terra Granada Drive, number 3A. I've been here just 15 months and I'm a board member on the tennis club. I feel very strongly that tennis and pickleball should be separate. The most convincing article I read was Frank Has Haswell's because he spoke to people at nearby clubs that combined the two sports and did not work at either one. As the fastest growing sport, I believe it deserves a facility of its own, pickleball. I don't know why Hillside area was taken off the table. I think we should reconsider it because of parking and bathrooms there. Um, I would like to see an indoor facility which would extend hours of play and make it possible on hot summer months and windy days and take care of noise complaints. Uh, I know it costs money, but it will make Rossmore more desirable. Let's enhance this beautiful place and not diminish it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have handle name Bernie Wolf. Bernie, I'm unmuting you. You have three minutes to address the board. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. My name is Bernie Wolf. I live at 2936. Sackland Indian Drive. I've had the pleasure of being a resident of Rossmore for six years. I've been very active in the tennis club, being a past president some years back. I also have played pickleball, and I see the synergy between those two sports. A lot of our tennis players cross over to play pickleball, uh, some uh, because of health issues. I'm speaking on the preservation of the Buckeye Tennis Complex. And I say that's revisited because I thought we had put it to rest. I'm saddened that we haven't put to rest the idea of keeping the Buckeye complex exclusively for the use of the tennis players. I thought that decision had already been made and now we are revisiting this issue. Is it possible that some on the board of GRF being pickleball players has something to do with this? That issue aside, my experience on Monday, March 21st, brought home to me the need for eight tennis courts to be used exclusively for tennis. The women's team at that time was practicing on three courts at 11 a.m. The men's team came to practice at that same time and used four courts. This left one court for a gentleman who wanted to practice on a free court. This is not a rare circumstance. Rossmore Tennis Club has clinics, tournaments, Interclub competitions that frequently take up multiple courts. Out of courtesy, the tennis club has made a policy to keep one or two courts unused for any Rossmore residents to use. 
Thus, you could see the need for all eight courts being available for tennis play. There needs to be another solution to finding more courts for pickleball players than taking away courts that are already getting fully used by tennis players. I think you're going to hear from some other members of the tennis community about what some of those options might be. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is handle name Robert Benz. Robert, I'm unmuting you. Please state your full name and Ross Moore address. Mr. Benz, can you hear us? You are unmuted, Mr. Benz. All right, I'm going to mute you. I will try again later. Next up is Dave Blanchard. Dave, I am unmuting you. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Oh, Dave, it looks like you have an audio problem. It's letting me know that you don't have a microphone on your end. Please state your comment in the Q&A chat feature. Next up, hold on. Steve Hirsch. Steve, I am unmuting you. You have three minutes to address the board. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Hirsch. I'm at 4503 Terra Granada Drive, entry 16. I've been at Rossmore for eight years, and I am an avid pickleball player, and I am also a tennis player. Um, I am supporting uh, the... Uh, improvements that I have seen uh, of the pickleball club, and I am impressed with the ones that are being done at Gateway. Uh, I feel that uh, the tennis courts uh, need to remain at eight uh, courts. They are many times during peak times they are used. There's a very big difference between uh, how pickleball is played, where games last 15 to 20 minutes, all of the players get together and it's sort of a round robin as soon as one court empties and another fills up. So the, the maximum weight at a pickleball club is 15 or 20 minutes. But if it's crowded, like an advanced intermediate that I am, um, you could wait as much as 30 minutes. But in tennis, they're prearranged games and these games last an hour and a half. And uh, if you reduce the courts by 25%, that is a, a major hit for the tennis players. They're not able to complete their games or time them appropriately. Um, I do not believe that any facility here should take away the amenities that we already have. So I'm strongly urging to reconsider and, and push forward as much as possible that the uh, expansion of the pickleball courts, which I would definitely like to see because I am a pickleball player, uh, remain at the Creekside site. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, we have Al Peters. Al, please state your full name and Ross Moore address, and you have three minutes to address the board. It looks like Al is also encountering audio issues. I am going to ask that you enter your information in the Q&A chat feature. Um, there might be a lack of microphone or, or some such audio issue on your end. I do apologize. Uh, next up, Ken Anderson. Ken Anderson, I am allowing you to speak. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Am I on? Okay, I've got it now. Uh, Ken Anderson, 1100 Oakmont Drive, number four. Uh, last September, the GR board voted that membership in a Rossmore club did not require a director to recuse him or herself from participating in those club related activities. And I agree, unless, and this is very important, that director chooses to cast a vote that would take away the property from one club, only give it to their own club. That would be selfish, unethical, and a huge conflict of interest and should not be allowed. 
Two years ago, when the GRF board was looking into possible pickleball locations, director Leanne Hamaji was president of the Pickleball Club and the leading proponent to take away two tennis courts for pickleball. The GR board disagreed and voted unanimously to delete the tennis courts from consideration for a pickleball uh, location. Now, as chair of the planning committee, uh, she has reintroducing the effort to take away tennis courts and given them to her pickleball club, contrary to what the GR board wanted two years ago. Personally, I believe the pickleball club is trying to pack the GR board with its plan members so it can rob the tennis club to pay the pickleball club. Last year, two pickleball uh, players were newly elected to the GR board, joining one existing player, soon to be joined by a fourth in May. Would golfers tolerate the idea of packing the GR board to take away part of their golf course for pickleball? I think not. There were good reasons why the GRF board voted nine to zero against converting two tennis courts into two pickleball courts. Uh, the noise would be nerve wracking for neighboring tennis players. Uh, a difficult parking situation would be made much worse. And the tennis club does need all eight tennis courts for the 18 tournaments, events and competitions the club puts on annually with neighboring cities and clubs. This is a fact, contrary to what some pickleball players claim. It is true that there were tennis players on the GR board when they voted to create a first-class facility at Buckeye, but they never, never voted to take away anything from one club and give it to another. Even though I no longer play tennis or pickleball, I think both are important for Rossmore. But I really resent pickleball trying to take away something that the tennis club worked so long and hard to establish especially since the membership of the tennis club is now increasing. Creekside would be a much better alternative. I would hope that the GR board would once again vote to exclude to converting tennis courts into pickleball courts. Thank you for your time and service. Thank you. I'm going to revisit to the individuals having audio issues. Uh, Al Peters, I'm going to try and unmute you. Go ahead, Al. Yes, am I on now? Yes, please state your full name and Rossmore address. Okay, my name is Albert Peters, and I live at 3330 Terra Granada Drive, number 4C. And I appreciate this time of uh, being able to speak to the board. Uh, the issue of where to build additional pickleball courts recalls three, what I call rule, three of many rules to govern by that I use while serving eight years on the Piedmont City Council including two years as mayor. One, the cheapest solution is not necessarily the fairest or the best. Again, the cheapest solution is not necessarily the fairest or the best. Two, don't take away from one constituency for the benefit of another. Again, don't take away from one constituency to benefit another. And three, your vote must be what is best for all residents, not just the special interests that you are associated with. Your vote must not, must, uh, must be what is best for all constituents, all residents, not just the special interests that you are associated with. The cheapest solution to adding pick more pickleball courts in Rossmore is most likely converting one or more Buckeye tennis courts to pickleball courts. But the havoc that this would cause, in my judgment, makes that choice untenable. The two racket sports do not mix well in such a confined location. Expanding the facility at Creekside would provide pickleball with its own upgraded facility, a much better alternative for tennis and pickleball players alike. It may be more expensive, but considerably of greater value. Converting tennis courts to pickleball courts harms an existing community. No different from taking away a portion of the golf course or dog park or Stanley Dollar picnic area or the facilities at Hillside. Let's promote all of Rossmore's activities and clubs and not have them compete against one another. We should not compete about where we should put a new facility. I know from my own tenure in elected office that the Golden Rain Foundation board members must hear 
from a lot of people and get pulled in many directions. The pickleball club is large and persuasive, but their yeah, cause seconds left. Okay, their cause must be weighed against the best interests of the rest of us. Thank you so much for this time to speak to you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try um, a previous speaker, Robert Benz. I'm going to try and find you in the list of individuals. Okay, no longer in attendance. Next, Dave Blanchard. I saw you there, I'm gonna try and unmute you. Nope, still audio issues. I apologize, gentlemen. All right, next up we have Chloe Camprath. I'm unmuting you. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Um, it's Chloe Camprath and I'm at 1124 Singingwood Court in 31. And I've been here 11 years. Uh, my, my statement is to first to uh, thank the board and the regular department for the work that they're doing plaza. Um, I've been talking about the town square concept for a long time, and I love that Jeff uh, Matheson talked about that. So it's really, it was such a pleasure to go down on Tuesday. There was music. It was casual. I didn't have to make reservations. I didn't have to buy a ticket. I could go and just be with my friends for a short period of time. So hooray that we've done it, and let's. I hope that we can put more into that and really make it part of the the interaction for the community, which may take care of some of the things that Tim was talking about. That's the second thing quickly I wanted to say. I hope that there's something that we can do to manage or to help change some of the behaviors that, that Tim was talking about. Tim, there was that was such a long piece that I'm afraid some people probably didn't read all of it. So maybe we could do some more stuff in the newspaper. We could... Um, interview some employees. I, anyway, I hope that the Planning Commission and the rest of us can figure out how to do that. So that's all for me today. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Carol Pillsbury. Carol, I'm unmuting you. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Audio issues with Carol. I am going to come back to you, Carol. Next up, we have handle name Mary. Mary, I am unmuting you. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Hello, uh, my name is Mary Ramos. I live at 2145 Ptarmigan, number one. And I want to comment on a couple items on the agenda. Uh, number one, the um, finance committee increasing the uh, the um, membership fees from 10 to 10 to 12 percent, which is a 20 percent, 10 to 12,000, which is a 20 percent increase, which I don't disagree with. Uh, what I have a little concern about is voting on annually changing it and buffing it up $500 every year. That may work for now, but I think that should be something that is a two to three year plan and reviewed maybe every three years just to see how it's working. Um, second, a um, couple of times I've heard people comment on considering hiring residents uh, to do some of the jobs that are uh, that need to be filled. I, I think that should be considered maybe even you know, some sort of signing or longevity bonuses for the new people to entice you know, out other people to come in. And then the, my last item is uh, concerning Tim's uh, speech on uh, the pandemic. I wrote an email and asked, for, uh, asked several questions um, over us choosing to be stricter than the county. And I never received a response, so I am going to resend it. Um, and Tim, you know, I like you very much, but you made a comment that everybody is at risk, 100%. Well, I don't think anybody who's 
under 60, maybe even under 65 is 100% at risk. And we do have people that young. I think it's great to have the county comment on our age group and what we can do to keep us safer. But I don't think that's GRF's job. I think that uh, imposing any kind of restrictions that are strictly a recommendation is not why we moved to Rossmore. We can guide our own destiny and I'd like you to con reconsider uh, the position that you stated earlier. And I thank the board very much. I think you do a good job. And I haven't uh, heard any bad interaction, interactions with staff, but that is totally unacceptable. But I kind of wonder, what do you expect when people who drive around here think a stop sign's a suggestion? So- I have uh, 20 seconds. Anyway, I'd somehow how you change people's attitude, uh, that's a toughie and good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm gonna try Carol Pillsbury one more time. Carol, I am unmuting you, but it is informing me there are some audio issues on your end. I do apologize. Feel free if you have the time to type in your question in the Q&A chat feature, I will get to it. Or you can email the board at grb at rossmore.com. Uh, next up we have Victoria. Uh, Victoria Feldman, I'm going to try you and uh, find you. Uh, nope, she left. And we have Mr. Benz, who was able to come back on and fix his audio. I am unmuting you. Robert Benz, please state your full name and Rossmore address. Oh, good morning. My name is Bob Benz. I live at 2800 Tice Creek Drive, apartment seven. I am an architect and a general contractor. I am here to present several questions that the community still has regarding the decision by the planning committee to request GRF's approval for a second noise study, this time at the Buckeye Tennis Court. GRF must deny this request for the following reasons. When GRF approved a budget to renovate Creekside Pickleball from three to seven courts, Residents expressed their concern about the additional noise this expansion would create. The high-pitched pulsating sound of pickleball was annoying to many. GRF commissioned a noise study for the Creekside site. According to the original noise study, several sound control measures were recommended, including, for example, the use of low noise paddles, softer balls, and the construction of a solid sound barrier between 10 and 12 feet high. No matter where the activity takes place, the study concludes, Noise abatement will not necessarily be a solution or provide the residents with the assurance that they will not be acoustically impacted. It is reasonable to assume based on the noise study already performed that sound is really a limiting factor of Buckeye because of how it's situated in the valley. As well, if parking is completely inadequate at Buckeye to accommodate the additional influx of traffic, then the planning committee had more than enough information to take Buckeye off the table uh, a long time ago. GRF has seen several options, ranging from Creekside renovation from three to seven courts, Buckeye conversion of two courts into eight pickleball courts, and GRF has seen an expansion at Creekside with restrooms and a 5,000 square foot shade structure. The Walnut Creek Planning Department expressed their reservations for approval of such a structure within, this, within the Creek setback. The original option from three to seven courts has never been properly evaluated the planning committee has gone round and round on this issue for too long. In the business, this is known as scope creep. Before voting to move beyond a conceptual study for a full pickleball facility to enter into an agreement with an architect to complete the plans and specifications to put the project out to bid, the planning committee instead voted three to one to request the second noise study, this time at Buckeye. Deny this request and complete the original cost analysis of Creekside renovation from three to seven courts without the restrooms, without the shade structure, but including sound abatement measures since you cannot unring that bell. Thank you. Thank you. I saw that Carol Pillsbury was able to unmute herself. I'm gonna try one more time, Carol. 
Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please state your full name and Rossmore address and you have three minutes. Hi, my name is Carol Pillsbury and I live at 1332 Running Springs Road. I'm a member of both the pickleball and the tennis clubs and it's very important to me that both sports have great facilities here in Rossmore. The road to a better pickleball facility has been long and frustrating. There have been many proposals, but no good choice. One of the proposals is to take two of the tennis courts at the Buckeye facility and convert them to eight pickleball courts. This plan would cut the number of tennis courts by 25% and seriously impact all aspects of tennis in Rossmore. Just nine years ago, GRF at significant expense expanded the Buckeye tennis courts from six to eight. The current eight courts are needed now just as much as they were then. An average of 70 people play tennis daily at Buckeye. Players regularly have to wait for a court. The proposal to cut Buckeye tennis courts by 25% is not a solution to our pickleball problem. It is a profoundly flawed plan. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I have one um, resident forum statement that was um, sent in. So I am going to read it aloud. Starting timer. John S. Preston, 1138 Skycrest Drive, number four, to the Golden Rain Board. I write this letter as a tennis player and Ross Morian and as one who actually likes and plays pickleball. However, I have grave concerns about taking the tennis courts for use of pickleball. Just because they look like they might work for pickleball and maybe a little cheaper is not a sound rationale for taking them. In fact, it is just the opposite. If pickleball courts are needed, they need to be added, not taken away from someone else. Here is why. First and foremost, I came to Rossmore with tennis in mind as part of the HOAs. I believe in both my contractual rights to have what I was promised by GRF and the morality owed to members of the tennis club who have long standing with the courts more below. Secondly, the eight courts are under immense pressure as of now. I will detail the uses ascribed to them currently below. The board will see that they are not vacant hardly at all. Thirdly, sound. If any of you have ever watched a tennis match on TV and the crowd is talking, what happens? The announcer speaks up to silence the crowd so that the match can continue. Try to imagine playing tennis in eight pickleball courts right next to the remaining six tennis courts. Not only would you condemn the courts, but ruin the tennis for the remaining six courts, essentially killing the tennis club and all of its tournaments with outside clubs. The logical knee-jerk reaction would be to do a sound study. We all know what it sounds like. Moral rights. Please imagine you are a new buyer to Rossmore and you play tennis. You are shown all of the great facilities, including the tennis courts, and you decide, yep, this is where I'll buy and pay the hefty HOA fees. As a result of your detrimental reliance on the facilities and representations made, you purchase and agree to pay the HOA fees, the coupon. You are shown an idyllic, tranquil setting, and instead you now end up with an incessant loud popcorn popping, inadequate parking, urban setting. I have been asked to do a bit of research on how this all shakes out. However, I prefer to rely on the common sense of the board members to simply do the right moral and ethical thing. Give people what they bargained for when they bought here, plain and simple. Noise to the tennis players. So if you were to condemn the two courts, the remaining six courts would be far less usable. The sound, as you know, travels and is harsh. As mentioned above, if you go or watch any tennis match, it is played in silence for many reasons. It's not like football or baseball or basketball. As mentioned above, if one sees tennis matches played, the announcer always quiets the crowd before any point. The strategy, the rhythm, all will get disru disrupted by eight courts of pickleball. In some ways, it is like goose hunting on the golf course. Oh, that's time. And that concludes the resident forum. All right, Deborah, thank you very much for coordinating that. Uh, next to uh, resident member committee reports, aquatics advisory, Daryl Svoboda, Committee Chair, we look forward to your report. Um, good morning, board members. Hi, uh, am I? Um, 
Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good okay, morning. Thank you. Uh, the Aquatics Advisory Committee report dated March 10th, 2022 is included in your agenda packet. Are there any um, questions that I can take at this moment? Gerald, I think you need to expound a little bit on the, um, the committee's deliberations about lifeguards, if you could. Um, yes, there were quite a few deliberations and ultimately um, there was a, let me find it here, a vote for moving forward to open the pools in the absence of lifeguards. And, and, but I believe that there's gonna be room for uh, specific situations. For instance, uh, the Tice pool and the spa might require uh, a prioritizing lifeguards in those, situ in those positions. Um, in addition, I'm just gonna read from 9A, new business on the, uh, the 310 um, Aquatics Advisory Committee. Uh, Jeff Matheson reported that there are not enough lifeguards to cover all the pools this summer. This, this we already agree on. He further indicated that GRF can operate without lifeguards. GRF has checked with the county and its insurance carrier with proper signage and equipment, it is legal for GRF to do so. And uh, Jeff recommended having one shift a day at the outdoor pools from seven to three o'clock, um, allowing us to um, adjust for the number of lifeguards that we have. And the pools would be open for normal hours, six to 8 p.m. with residents uh, being responsible for their own um, enjoyment of the pools. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. And I and that is the next item on our agenda. Any other questions for Daryl at this point? Uh, so uh, let's move on with, uh, uh, thank you, Daryl. And please stick around as Jeff uh, reports uh, perhaps much of the same uh, mm -hmm. on the Aquatics Advisory Committee's recommendation, Jeff. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, so this item is a, a recommendation from the Aquatic Advisory Committee to consider the operation of the outdoor pools on a limited basis with no lifeguard on duty. Uh, we are restricting it to the recommendation to the outdoor pools uh, based on the spa and other conditions at Tice. As you are very well aware, and we've discussed numerous times and in, in with the Aquatic Advisory Committee that the recruitment and, and hiring of lifeguard staff on an annual basis, uh, especially in the fall and spring uh, seasons has been very, very challenging. Uh, this has been a longstanding issue, not only with Rossmore, but uh, the, the industry of lifeguarding in general. Uh, many of the surrounding agencies uh, experienced the same same challenges in recruitment. Last year, we actually had to limit some of the hours at the outdoor pools strictly because we did not have enough lifeguard coverage. And uh, during the time when this was uh, one of the only amenities that was uh, met with a lot of frustration from some dedicated swimmers. I have long advocated with the, the committee and the board the absolute importance of lifeguard coverage. And I still believe in that uh, when I we, we hire people in, in Rossmore uh, for lifeguard duties, we often tell them that you know, this is a location where you will put your skills to the test. Um, you can work at a community pool for a city for many years and, and do nothing more than really hand out a Band-Aid. In Rossmore, there is a high likelihood that you will put your skills to the test at some point during your, your period, your time here. Um, in the report, I give you a, a little example. At, at Tice Pool over 2021, we had 21 trip and falls, one, <clears throat> one water rescue and first aid was provided four times. Uh, at Dollar Pool, we had two trip and falls, four water rescues, and several bee stings. Hillside, there was three trip and falls, one water rescue, 
and several bee stings. <clears throat> bee stings are always a, a challenge at the outdoor pools. We certainly don't know what the outcome of those water rescues would have been. Sometimes it's somebody slips off a noodle and, and needs assistance, but you, know, you never know to the extent that um, you know, further assistance may have been needed. That being said, with the ongoing challenges, we have done some outreach to our um, sister communities uh, that are um, senior, active senior communities or just uh, active communities. And many of those communities have either converted to no lifeguards or have uh, partial scheduling without lifeguards on duty. Uh, I did check with the county health who permits our pools to operate. And in your packet there, I've, I've cited many of the codes, the health and safety codes that uh, require lifeguard coverage only when <clears throat> you have a paid uh, gate, <clears throat> excuse me, a paid gate attendance. So uh, as long as we are not collecting fees uh, to come into the pool, lifeguarding is not required. There is signage requirements and uh, certain equipment requirements, which we have already. We also checked with our insurance carriers to make sure that uh, going without lifeguards would not impact our current coverage or um, increase our rates or have any impact. And as long as we are in compliance with the health and safety codes, uh, we are fine with the insurance and liability coverage. The goal is not to eliminate lifeguards, but to uh, try and uh, limit closures and provide uh, limited times in the outdoor pools when we, we may not have coverage. For example, uh, we would have a period of time in the morning from opening till seven or eight o'clock, and then we would have a lifeguard uh, for an eight hour shift. And then towards the evenings, we would have about three hours without a lifeguard. Uh, if we are able to recruit and have enough lifeguards, we would provide the coverage uh, as necessary. During programs such as uh, family swim time, we would have coverage. And again, for the indoor pool, because of the spa, we would maintain full coverage. So this is a, a recommendation from the Aquatic Advisory Committee that we proceed after their uh, debate without uh, lifeguards during limited hours um, and post those times. Uh, so people would have the opportunity to decide if they, they are comfortable with swimming without lifeguards or if they want to come during a time when we do have lifeguard coverage at, at the various pools. Happy to answer questions. Okay. Uh, Neva, did you have a motion that you wanted to make? You're on, you're on mute, Neva. Yes. Um, I move that we... Um, adopt the recommendation of the aquatics committee to operate the pool, the outdoor pools with one lifeguard shift and non-lifeguarded periods with proper signage at the beginning and end of the pool opening days, periods. Is there a second? I'll second. I'll Thank second. You, Thank you, Mary. Uh, so discussion on the motion, Leanne and then Carl. Mindy. Oh. Yeah, um, Jeff, uh, in the civil code that you reference in the board packet, um, it says that they're a, a user of the defib defibrillator in an, uh, sorry, hard to say, in an emergency at the pools would um, not lead to liability for the person using the machine. It doesn't say if other methods of life saving were applied. So if a resident tried to help, a, if there was no lifeguard at a pool and a resident tried to help another with say mouth to mouth or, um, you know. Compression. Resuscitation, right. Um, would there be liability in that case to the resident helping? I defer, uh, Tom, do you have any insight on that if you're uh, on the line? in regards to providing uh, yeah. assistance. <clears throat> yeah, the Good Samaritan rule 
uh, kicks in and protects anybody who is doing something in an effort to save someone's life, as long as they're not doing something that is so out of the ordinary that an ordinary person wouldn't do, um, they're protected. Okay. Okay, uh, Carl and then Dale. Yes, I, I'm thinking if we're comparing our lifeguard wages with other lifeguarding facilities that are having the same problem, we may have to consider the fact that we really are competing against places like Costco, which I presume is paying a higher wage. Could we look into the possibility that there, we might have to take some extraordinary measures to recruit lifeguards that are considering other competitive fields, not just lifeguarding? Thank you for bringing that up. Actually, we have taken those measures. Um, our lifeguards' pay rates have increased uh, significantly over the, the past couple of years. Uh, I'd say we're, if not one of the highest, we're, we're definitely among the highest in the region uh, for lifeguard pay. We have done uh, efforts to recruit using sign-on bonuses, uh, referral bonuses for existing staff. Uh, we have uh, undertaken a social media campaign to try and reach uh, high school and college age applicants. We have contacted just about every school, uh, community college and college in the region, tried to reach out to not only the, the school's work uh, placement, but uh, swim coaches, uh, water polo coaches, uh, you name it. Uh, we have shaken the bushes. Uh, we are definitely competing with not only other uh, agencies hiring lifeguards, but when you can go to uh, Target and make $24 an hour now entry level, uh, it is very hard to compete, especially when you have to get licensed, you know, achieve a certification to be a lifeguard. So um, there are many challenges, not only the lack of uh, interest, but the, the competition out there from the Costco's, the you know, uh, other industries that are, are ramping up their pay. Okay, uh, Dale and then Kathleen. Yes, I'm gonna vote against this. Um, I, due to uh, the percent of frail people in Rossmore and also the possible number of people who have varying disabilities. Okay, uh, Kathleen. Uh, well, I will say uh, in answer to Dale's um, comments that um, if you're frail, then you can choose to only go swimming when there's a lifeguard there and the hours will be posted. I think another thing in the signage is um, that no one should swim by them alone, that there be a requirement that there be someone else there. And um, no other sport, uh, the tennis or any other pickleball or lawn bowling requires that there be someone there to, um, to provide safety uh, in, in an emergency. So I'm not sure that swimming should be any different. And uh, it's limited hours. It's not like there's no lifeguard. It would just, and if we can hire them, then we would have full coverage. So I'm definitely in favor of this. And I'm not in favor of paying lifeguards $25 an hour. Okay. Uh, uh, Ted. Uh, yeah, I have two questions and hopefully you can answer the first one fairly easily. Are most of the injuries that are happening in the time that the lifeguards you have scheduled for the lifeguards, say eight to three in this, in the, in, well, first of all, that part of it, are most of them happening in that time frame? So I, I have not mapped out the the time of each of those incidents uh, occurring. Uh, we, we know when some of our peak times are for usage, but in, in relation to those incidents that I cited, no, I, I haven't mapped those out. Would the lifeguard cover the peak times? Is that is that the time frame it is? <laughs> right. Our, our peak times are, you know, mid-afternoon uh, or, you know, 
mid morning to early afternoon. So that's when we would have uh, the lifeguard coverage. And um, I forgot what that other piece that I wanted to ask. So that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Leanne. I wondered if anybody had considered limiting family swim at a time when we're restricting lifeguards for our residents. Family swim is mostly guests. Um, I understand that you need lifeguards for children. I absolutely understand that. But at a time when we're limiting it for guests, I wonder if we've considered reducing family swim. So family swim occurs during a time when we would have lifeguard coverage. Uh, it's from 11 to 1 or 11 to 2 on the weekends. Uh, it is our highest attendance that we, we see uh, during the, the peak summer months uh, at, at the Hillside Pool. The Aquatic Advisory Committee has been debating and, and reviewing the family swim program for the last several months and will continue to do so during their next meeting. Um, in relation to location, times, and so forth. Okay, uh, Ted, and then I think we're ready for a vote. Okay, I just remembered my questions. One is uh, on um, lifeguards. I understand are a want for our for our community, but um, um, seeing the, the fact that it's so hard to hire them and it's probably looking since we've been looking at this every since last, when I got on the board last, you know, June, this was a topic about, we got this problem. It doesn't sound like it's going away. So, so this is, we either have an, and this is the question, we either going to have an alternative or is it the other alternative be we don't have dollar and hillside operating at all unless there's a person there to do it. Is that correct? Do I understand that? That's pretty correct. Uh, the alternative is when we do not have uh, adequate staffing to provide coverage, we would close the one or both outdoor pools uh, during times we didn't have coverage. And the other piece of that question is uh, kind of on uh, Leanne's, uh, I was very surprised hearing in the uh, last aquatics meeting that there is a large number of people that tend to throw birthday parties for families and outside family members. So if the kids are, if their grandkids are gonna come and they bring 10 of their friends for a birthday party to family swim, how would that affect us and our insurance and who's responsible for that? And do we have to, uh, if they're going to do that, do we have to have extra lifeguards at that pool to watch families swim and just kind of what goes on during that period and how does that dynamic work with outside people other than grandkids coming in to swim? So during family swim, uh, a resident member has to be in attendance with any of their, their guests that they have. It, their guests do not have to be a grandchild or a, a son or daughter or relative. Uh, it could be any, we don't define who the guest is. Uh, we also do not currently define how many people a resident uh, may bring as a guest. So uh, during family swim, uh, somebody may bring several guests for a period of time. Uh, we do not have a large number of birthday parties and, and other parties that take place there, but there are occasions when a family may have a, a gathering of, of people. Uh, during family swim, we would have lifeguard coverage uh, as uh, there are youth and, and certainly a lot more people involved in, in being at the pool. Uh, our lifeguard coverage really is dependent on the number of, of people we would anticipate. So during the, the summer months on a weekend when uh, we may get as, as many as 100 or so people at Hillside Pool, we would have adequate coverage. During the week when we may have very limited coverage in schools in session, for example, uh, we would have one lifeguard on, on duty. So we adjust accordingly. We are ready to uh, vote on a motion that needs to be restated. But Dale, did you have something to uh, question? I just want to point out that the um, if someone loses consciousness on any of our um, facilities, our sporting facilities, 
water is the only one where they're going to drown and die. Okay. Uh, Deborah, you requested a restatement of the motion, I believe. Neva, could you do that, please? You're muted, Neva. Deborah, read what. Can, can I? Yes. I, oh, sorry. Could ju jump in. If, if we could keep the motion limited to uh, authorizing the operation of the outdoor pools on a limited basis without lifeguards, that way it gives us flexibility based on what we're able to cover and, and not cover. Instead of, I think the original motion stated morning and evening, that would be our plan. But if, if we could have the authorization to operate outdoor pools on a limited basis without lifeguards. Okay. Are you all right with that, Neva? Uh, yeah, I move that uh, we authorize the outdoor pools to be operated on a limited basis without lifeguards. Yeah, and Mary, said, I agree with that. Signing. I agree with that. Mary, oh, you're okay. If, if, if I may, if you want to adopt the recommendation or did you, of the Aquatics Advisory Committee to authorize the outdoor pools to operate without lifeguard coverage during scheduled times when staffing is unavailable. Is that, that's what I have down. Is that not clear? Neva, are you okay with that wording? I'm, I'm okay with that. Okay, I'm Mary, okay are you okay with that? With that? Okay, okay, all right. I'm okay with that. Okay, so now we know the motion is on the floor. <laughs> We're ready for a vote. Uh, Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumfield? Yes. Hamaji? No. Hurt? Was I'm that a yes, that? Mary? Okay, I see your head shaking yes. in the affirmative. Bentley? Uh, yes. Brown? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? No. Mataraki. No. Carries. Okay. Thank you, everyone. With that, uh, we are at 1026. Let's take a five minute break and return at 10, actually, uh, 1032. Return at 1032. Yeah. Okay, it is 10.32. We'll get restarted as soon as we are ready here. Just wait a little bit longer. All right, so let's continue with resident Member of Committee Reports, Finance Committee. I understand uh, Bill Dorban has been invaded by grandchildren this week and that uh, Jerry Yearout is going to present the Finance Committee Report. Jerry? I was not in Slim Hold on, let me try and find her. I don't see Jerry present. Okay. Um, Mary or Joel, could you uh, perhaps give us a summary of the Finance Committee report? Mary, you're muted. I can give a summary. Uh, basically, the Finance Committee voted to increase the uh, membership transfer fee to 12000 a year beginning this year and then increase that amount, $500, at the beginning of every year subsequent to that. It was based on the facilities master's plan funding request, which basically requires this amount of money to continue having Rossmore look and act and be available the way it is. The, uh, it's based on, uh, well, the, the, the report. Joel, do you have the report that shows how the funding plays out over the time? Uh, yeah, so uh, so the the total facility master plan, so we say wish list was uh, approximately seventy million dollars. So the uh, uh, what the planning committee and and uh, Jeff had uh, 
essentially adjusted that down to approximately $47 million over a 10-year time period. So uh, with the uh, with the proposed increase in the membership transfer fee, that would uh, this would essentially uh, fund uh, a good portion of this over the 10 year time frame. Okay. I think it was it funds it through about five years of the intended te- 10 year or something close to that. Yeah, but but also keep in mind that even with the increase in the membership transfer fee, if the all of the $47 million was approved over the 10 year time frame, the the trust would still need to borrow additional funds. Right. Okay. So um, there is an agenda item here about considering this increase in the membership transfer fee. And uh, Tim, did you want to make some other comments yeah. in regards to that? I'm sorry, Dwight, I wasn't sure <clears throat> what about the MTF did you want me to address? It, it, well, just the, uh, the the agenda item to consider the increasing membership transfer fee that we're not going to take any action today on that today. because we'll, oh. we want to have a second reading, if you will, of this issue. But I didn't know if, uh, Tim, you wanted to provide any more background on that. Sure, I can, I can give you a little more insight. So <clears throat> the last uh, couple of times that when, when the board has authorized an increase in the membership transfer fee, it became effective approximately three to four months after the board's vote. And that's to allow the real estate industry, basically the realtors, the home sellers, the escrow and title people to give them proper notice that the fee is going to be changing. So uh, if and when you decide to do that, this, uh, you'd want to make it effective. I would recommend at least 90 if and perhaps 120 days after the board's vote, the first of the month following the board's vote. Um, and then what we'll do is if that is approved, then we would notify the realtors and, you know, all the, it would obviously be publicized in the newspaper and basically putting people on notice that the fee is going to be changing. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Uh, yeah, I've been um, thinking about this a lot, and um, and I know that um, to me there's consideration of it costing um, a lot of money that you, if you buy in that you don't get back. And we have properties that are a million and a half. I don't know; they'll be two million, uh, but we also have properties that are uh, four hundred thousand, three hundred thousand. Um, and those would be mostly um, older places with uh, just one bedroom. And the people who, who would buy those would be a single person, m- much more likely than a couple, where the upper end are, are bigger and um, they have uh, more likely uh, a, a couple living in them. So I think if we do too much, uh, with raising the transfer fee, uh, it would make it very difficult for a single person without a, a large income to be able to buy in. So this is a problem. I know we need more money for the capital projects. The community is older. Things need to be done. We need um, the MOD buildings and a lot of other stuff. So um, I know that the, our sister community in Maryland instead of doing a um, just the same amount for everyone, they do it on a percentage of uh, what you purchased. I, I don't agree with that entirely because we all use the amenities equally. So uh, I would like everyone to think a little bit about a little bit of a compromise. So have a 10 or $12,000 um, uh, uh, fee, but on top of that, have a 2% of the cost of what you uh, bought so that a little bit more of the cost is uh, carried by uh, those who can most readily afford it. So I would like to have um, Joel and the Finance Committee 
uh, look into this possibility a little more. You know, so if you have a two million dollar property and you're paying a two percent, um, you know, uh, on top of that, uh, you'd be twelve hundred thousand. I mean, twelve thousand plus uh, the two percent. You would be getting fourteen or or more thousand um, uh, dollars from there. Where someone who's buying a one bedroom, uh, less expensive. They don't have as much money. They would only be paying um, twelve thousand or twelve and a half thousand. So um, anyway, so I would like to see that uh, as a consideration before we make a decision uh, about raising it to to uh, twelve thousand plus five hundred thousand each additional uh, year. Thank you. And Kathleen, just to clarify, two percent of two million is forty thousand dollars. So I think you're okay. Well, what, your yeah, decimals that, are off a little bit, but I think yeah. the the message is, is the message clear. is there, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Mary, and then Dale, then Ted, then Carl. One of the things that the finance committee considered very, very carefully when looking at this was that the amount of projected facility master plan over ten years was very much taken down. In other words, everything that was on the wish list is not projected to be put in play in the next 10 years because they very conservatively also said, we, we can't go there. So you have that fact in mind. The other thing you, we can consider here at Rossmore, because we're very, very lucky, we still, even with this fee, are one of the more, maybe the only truly affordable housing place in the Contra Costa County. So even though it would make it harder for some people to cover those costs, we're still much, much more affordable than almost anywhere else in Contra Costa County. Okay. Uh, Dale and then Ted and Carl. Yeah. Uh, I have a question uh, for Tim. Uh, Tim, when we have first and second readings, the verbiage is always identical on both of those. So let's assume that that what we have in front of us now is is exact the same wording that would occur at the second reading where then we can actually make a motion could we make a motion at that meeting to not include the additional uh, five hundred thousand dollars even though that would be would have been in the first and second reading do you mean do you mean the extra five hundred dollars? You said you said five hundred thousand. I'm, I'm sorry, five hundred. Okay. <clears throat> so here's here's the thing with the with any fee that GRF imposes, you don't have a requirement to have multiple readings. So you do for policies, but fees aren't policy. The policy already gives you the right to establish the fee. And then the fees, traditionally, the board would just adopt whatever the change in fees are. We don't change fees very often, but when we do on something, the board just, you know, adopts the fee schedule or whatever it is, and, and we move forward. <clears throat> but because of the size of this fee and, and the, the fact that it affects every home that transfers, this is, you know, it's a sizable amount of money, obviously, and... Um, so m my recommendation was that you consider doing this over a, a multiple, re you know, multiple readings, what we call readings. So, and all that means is that it gets on the board agenda. It can be discussed, although it doesn't have to be discussed at the first reading. And then it comes back a month later for a second reading. That gives the community basically notice and gives people the opportunity to weigh in and, and express their opinions back to you. And so you hear that before you make the vote. Um, as you know, you know, things that are, have any form of controversy to them, if they're rushed through or there's a perception that it was rushed through, the board ends up getting a lot of blowback on those kinds of things. So, um, it's, your, so it's your decision whether or not you want to go to a second or a third reading. I would suggest that whatever you decide to do, that it, it'd be out there in that form for then two months, at, for example, if you decide you want to do it, uh, you know, a second reading. Oh, okay. If you decide to change the proposal, so the finance committee has made a proposal to you. And if you decide that you want to deviate from that, say to adopt some derivative of what Kathleen just suggested, 
then I would suggest you then have two readings of that. So next month and then the month after. So because it's different than what the finance committee has proposed. And, or as Kathleen also suggested, send this back to the finance committee to have it be reevaluated, to have her concept evaluated to see whether there's merit to that and then see what the committee recommends. You don't have to do any of that. You could decide, you know, whatever, if you decide to make a motion here today, um, then you can move forward with this if you wanted to. But again, this is a large increase. It's a 20% increase that's being proposed. Um, when we last increased it from 7,000, well, I should say when we went from 9,000 to 10,000, I don't believe we did it in, in two readings. Uh, the time before that, when we went from 7,000 to 9,000, I think, I think historically the board's always done it in a single meeting. I don't recall that we did that in two meetings. But um, again, this is a this is a big dollar amount, and, and we're not just talking about a one-time adjustment. We're talking about adopting, or the proposal is to adopt it going forward with an annual increase on top of that. So I think that that the magnitude of this I think merits further consideration and to have you know two readings of the proposal, whatever that is, whether it's this proposal the finance committee has proposed or whether. Um, you adopt something else similar to either Kathleen's idea or some other idea that you've got. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. So we could, if we chose, we could eliminate the, the $500 increase, but stick with the 12,000, the 12,000, for instance. Correct. You could do that. Yeah, okay. We've got a lot of, a lot of comments here. Let's keep moving. Uh, Ted, Carl, Mary, Paul, and Aniva. Okay, um, most of the people moving in here are usually selling something to move when they do move in here. When I moved in, uh, the situation at the time was you had to pay cash to be able to get into the unit I was in. And since then, the value of my place has gone up over three times. The coupon or the MTF has only gone up. It's only doubled. So it hasn't even kept up with the value of my what my property is and what the amenities need to be done. Uh, the event center and Creekside weren't here when I moved in. They were put in after I moved in. I saw the old pro shop and the old, you know, uh, golf area and and the and everything that was around, all the protests and all the stuff, everything against the event center. And then now the event center here, and everybody loves the event center. They it's packed all the time. They just you know and and both of those when you stand in that area of Rossmore, you could actually picture yourself in Tahoe. I mean, it is gorgeous and it has driven up the value of all of the properties around. But if we don't have money coming in, we're not going to be able to do these amenities and builds for Rossmore. So if we don't, Rossmore is going to start eventually down the line is going to start going the other way and start looking old and tired. All this money is to invest back into Rossmore to keep ahead of the time, to keep us looking good. So basically I'm saying, I wish it was a $15,000. I was surprised that they took it down to 12, but I'm all for it for 12. Okay. Carl, Mary, Paul, and Neva. Carl, you're okay. muted. There yes, you go. I, I'm unmuted now. Yeah. Um, one of the problems is I think we've considered something along the lines that Kathleen proposed. The problem is, is I understand this is actually more of a legal issue than it is a financial issue in the fact that it is a membership transfer fee. And as a consequence, we would get into legal trouble. And I think, uh, we would probably need a legal review of this because it's my understanding that we may get into trouble if we try and essentially assess the property and its value, plus the fact that a single member can own multiple houses. It would be an issue that I think uh, would require far more study than a simple discussion here. And I think we would need uh, a legal opinion on whether we could do this without getting into trouble. Okay, uh, Mary, Paul, Neva. 
Um, thank you. I, I would prefer that this go back to the Finance Committee for two reasons. One is the amount of data that has been charted to show the impact of the increase or the lack of the increase and the reason the $500 per year was added when you see it in the chart forms and you see the impact based on the facilities master plan it's a real insight as ted said one way to solve the problem was to go to 15,000 this year but we decided that over time would probably be an easier thing but i would like to see the finance committee review this one more time and bring it back to the board okay uh paul and neva yes thank you um a lot of the, I, I've listened to the finance committee deliberations. I've also been a member of the plan planning committee. And a lot of the planning committee work has happened in, without, in the absence of um, firm or estimated building costs. And I think that, and, th and therefore we ended up with quite a wish list you know, which is exactly that. When, when I attended some of the breakout sessions in the, um, <clears throat> up, up at the event center, you know, people, there were lots of suggestions for things and that people would like to see without regard, in my opinion, for what they might cost, simply because they were doing a lot of brainstorming and making suggestions. And I think that the financial piece, as well as all of the other um, projects, as well as all the projects that are currently on this list have to be vetted further. They have to be uh, considered further and they have to be put you know, in, in some sort of other proper order. I think it's premature to be thinking that $70 million worth of improvements are going to be realized, whether it's in a 10-year plan or a 15-year plan. There are other factors um, that are coming down the line. Um, the fire mitigation, the fact that we have to take better care of our facilities, and that, that includes our wild lands, if you want to call it that. Um, all need to be put into this mix. So I think it's premature to be solely focused on this, um, this increase at this time. Okay. Uh, Neva and then Kathleen. I, I was struck by the fact that this, in yesterday's Rossmore News, there were two letters objecting to this increase and it was clear that they had no idea that it was tied to the projections of the facilities master plan of, and what it would cost to do some of the things in that, to do the things in that plan. So I think there needs to be time to present this to the community, to the relationship that the finance committees saw between the facilities master plan and the need for this increase and present this to the community in the newspaper with charts, projections, things like that, and let it be absorbed and discussed on a realistic basis before we take a vote on it. And I'd also like to, I also like Kathleen's idea of the, 2% of the value of the home. And if that needs to be investigated legally, we should ask our attorney to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kathleen and Ted. Okay, so, um, so I would like to go ahead and make a recommendation that we uh, send this back to the Finance Committee um, and to uh, uh, legal, uh, to look at the possibility of some, some sort of a hybrid solution. I understand um, fully from what Ted said that we need the money. This is an older community and um, mm -hmm. there are things that need to be done that we need money for. It's just a matter of how we are going to um, go about it and when, um, because, you know, 
maybe we don't need to do it all now. Um, and as Paul said, we need to look at it, but I, I, I'm sure we're going to need more money. So that's my recommendation. I didn't hear a motion, but I heard a recommendation. Why don't, why don't we just that's, take a straw vote on that recommendation? All those that support that recommendation, raise your hand. So I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. And opposed? I see. Hold on, two. hold on. Can I please? I have to record this um, for the record. Can please uh, return to everyone in favor? And I need to take a snapshot of the screen. Oh, so those in favor, raise your hand. It's a straw vote only. Okay, and opposed. Okay. Hold on, hold on, I'm sorry. It takes me a minute to do this. And, and Leanne and Ted smile as she, she's taking Thank a picture. You. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, uh, Kathleen, were you finished or you wanted you had something else? Well, no, I just, um, do we, uh, I, I would make that in the form of a motion if we, uh, if that's what's needed we, at this point. We, I don't think we need that. We're just okay. uh, <clears throat> recommending to move it back. Uh, okay. Ted? Okay, so, so just one thing to consider all this, when we look at this wish list and we look at all the different things, our heads are spinning with all the different things that could be done here. One of the things that was talked about early on and is going to be talked about again is what we can do better for our employees. And the mod complex is going to be $27,000. Where's the money going to come from to do that? We need, and that's on that wish list to be looked at, to be rebuilt. If we're really going to be concerned about our, our employees and doing them good, I've done a tour of that place. It's not the, it's not the beautiful Rossmore that we live in when you got to go to work to a spot like that every day. And that's what I'm thinking about when I say we need more money so that we can get that job done faster than later and get a nice place for them to be able to have a place to go to work and we can help to keep our employees longer and also give them a little breathing room. Geez, these people are shoulder to shoulder in there with plastic panels between them so they can have some privacy when they're on the phone. It is crazy. So that's what that's why I think that this should go forward. All the other stuff on the list will fall into place as we go through our deliberations on different things that Ross Moore needs. We're not saying that that the hillside has to be rebuilt right now, but it is on the list to be done. But hey, man, Ted, God, Ted, we're good. Ted, we're going to be discussing these priorities a little bit later in the meeting. I know, so but that's what I want to say. This shouldn't go back. This should a decision should be made now. I think that we can go ahead with. It, well, so the board has taken a straw vote to move it back to the finance committee. So let, let's let's move on and save your enthusiasm for the next uh, discussion, if you will. All right. Uh, anything else on this matter? Right. So next up is uh, Fitness Advisory Committee. Uh, Jim Grisell. Uh, good morning. Uh, I think uh, you've got the report from March and. Uh, if I can expand on that some. We've had, uh, let's see, well, we were closed, the fitness center was closed most of January and open reopened in February 10th. Uh, it appears that things are getting back to normal. Unique visits are up to where they were uh, uh, during the pandemic at time. Uh, Gina has added quite a few classes. We've got the new fellow Richard Bergstrom on um, that with that, the mobility and movement class is expanded to uh, two levels. Uh, diabetes and dementia prevention program is having their evaluations and assessments coming up this month. Uh, let's see. Our um, one thing I, I think I noticed, uh, and I think Dale asked about it once in an email to me. Mask use was at about twenty five percent few weeks ago and when I was in there yesterday it looks like about 10% of people may be still wearing masks which is fine I'm going to wear mine and I noticed Gina and Richard were wearing masks yesterday although the employees now don't have to uh, let's see what else um, some classes um, Gina Kathleen and Richard are planning a fall prevention program uh, probably later in the summer and let's see oh 
<laughs> okay, there's my video. Um, what else? Uh, the etiquette and wipe down of equipment, or putting back equipment uh, seems to be improving, and Gina has, is including that in the uh, orientations that uh, employer residents get when they come into the fitness center. Uh, I guess, yeah. do you have any questions of me or any? Thank you, Jim. Uh, I think Dale has a question. Yeah. I, I have a compliment. I, I want to compliment, as you know, I'm the ex officio member on that co uh, advisory committee. I want to compliment the advisory committee and the people there, their sensitivity towards people with disabilities. There was talk about needing to make wider space between some of the pieces of equipment for wheelchairs. And I, I just applaud that sensitivity and want the public to know about it. Okay, great. Yes, and right. uh, Krista Kell also mentioned uh, uh, wheelchair classes. And so, and Gina did say so she's thinking about how that might be accomplished. Great. All right. Any other questions for Jim? Jim, thank you very much. Appreciate your work on this. Uh, next up is golf advisory. And I I think I understand that John McDonald is not able to join us, but that Mark Heptig uh, may be jumping in to uh, tell us how well golf operations are going in 2022. And um, maybe I was mistaken about that, but uh, is Mark here? I don't see him. Hold on. Let me see if Dr. Wiener is available. He was yeah. going to... Mark oh, had Jeff some other sure. obligations, so was uh, un unable to stay on the line for that long. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, any questions on the golf reports? It's, it's an optimistic uh, reporting of what has transpired, even given the uh, shutdown in February. Didn't really shut down golf, but uh, right. Any questions? All right. Moving on. Uh, board committee reports. Uh, compensation. Kathleen. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, this is a report on the uh, regular meeting of the Compensation Committee on March 9th. So we discussed the, um, uh, an overview of the senior staff retention proposals, and um, there was discussion about it, and we asked um, um, Eric if he would do a little more research of other companies uh, to provide that provide uh, a matching percentage for the 401k contributions. Um, that's one of the proposals that we had for um, better um, staff retention. And also to uh, provide the committee um, for the, uh, what other companies provide for the years of service match for vacation or accrual rates. And he will uh, present those um, updates at the next uh, um, compensation committee meeting. Um, also, the uh, what's coming up for the committee is the CPIU discussion, uh, and this will take place in June um, after uh, we have to wait for the new rates to come out, and um, and after the new committees are seated at, in June. So that's uh, that's a report from compensation. Any questions? Uh, Carl. Yes, uh, I had requested a look back report, which is, would be the sum of the median salaries that we pay so that we get a look back because each year, we try and do an educated guess of what the salary increases are. However, we base that increase on what the market percentage is and then add those to our current budget as a base. However, we have no way since we are no longer going getting the Gallagher audits to determine whether this base is in fact correct and whether we need, whether we over or underestimated our budget in the past. And without that, I don't know how we can adjust these projected to actually reflect the real market. 
Um, so we, I, I should have mentioned this. We did go over our look back report, um, which is new and <clears throat> this year. Um, and it looks at the uh, median salaries for each position uh, that we have uh, that has at least two employees in the position. Um, and how many of the salaries that we have are over that median or under that median. And um, it was very um, useful um, for the um, HR, um, Eric, to, uh, to be able to look at. And we have, and he has a tool. We don't have the Gallagher report anymore, but he has an, all, a very good tool which um, can give him information about the, uh, the median salary for any given position. Um, and each year he looks at um, a certain number of those. He can't look at them all every year. And we couldn't of course do that before when we had Gallagher either. Uh, and so this report has aimed him to look at the ones that are um, you know, on the higher end and to see what the median is and see if the band um, that we uh, pay that particular um, situation is uh, is adequate or not. So this gives him a, a, a very good tool to be able to look at um, the, the bands and uh, what positions he needs to focus his research on for the coming uh, for the coming year. However, it doesn't provide us any budget quantitative in information. No, it doesn't. But I don't think the committee has has found that that's a, a, um, a consideration that we uh, need to uh, to spend um, time and effort on. It would be very difficult, and the um, the budget seems to work. Our budget estimates for the next year seem to work uh, fine uh, the way we're doing it currently. That was the committee's uh, conclusion. Okay. Uh, any other questions for Kathleen? Kathleen, thank you for uh, leading that effort with Eric to uh, find ways to retain and and, uh, and recruit our staff. That's terrific. Uh, next, uh, yeah, more planning to come committee. next month. Thank you, uh, Leanne Hamaji, Planning Committee. Yes, hi everybody. Um, so we. Uh, authorized or asked the board to authorize a sound study at Buckeye after reviewing the response from the city on the preliminary or the PRT report on Creekside. Um, we were very optimistic about what the city would report on four courts at Creekside. Um, unfortunately, uh, there were a lot of stipulations which we didn't expect, uh, which keeps the cost of construction at Creekside very high. Um, and that's why we asked for the sound study at Buckeye. And I'm gonna refer to Jeff to give us an update on that PRT and the process. Okay, thank you. Um, in your packets, there is a uh, presentation on the layout of Hillside that we submitted to the city for preliminary review and, and feedback. Um, it's called the PRT process. Excuse it, me, Jeff. Yes. Not at Hillside, at Creekside. At Creekside. Thank you. Um, and th the feedback that we receive, a lot of it is some boilerplate information on um, permitting that we would need to address in relation to uh, storm drainage, in relation to uh, accessibility and so forth. Uh, we did receive some specific feedback in relation to uh, a proposed shade cover in relation to uh, how many square feet that could be before uh, requirements such as uh, sprinkler systems may kick in. Uh, there is also some feedback that we received regarding the creek setback. Um, the requirement is 50 feet, but it's based on the slope of the um, the creek and the location. So since the pickleball courts are on a flat surface, uh, we don't think that uh, requirement would would be implemented. Uh, thus, we would still be able to proceed with a shade structure and a restroom facility. Um, there was uh, pretty significant feedback. How, however, none of it at this point seems to be insurmountable. 
uh, we would learn a, a lot more as we uh, develop the plans further and actually submit for plan review and, and building permits. Uh, the uh, planning committee at, at their last meeting reviewed the uh, proposal for uh, the Creekside location and before proceeding, decided to recommend to the board that we take uh, an additional look at Buckeye so that they have some comparative information. Uh, the next step at Buckeye before you did any further planning would be to uh, consider a sound study. Uh, that is pretty much the determining factor up there in relation to can you mitigate the sound for not only uh, activities taking place on the tennis courts, but uh, more importantly for the neighborhood as the Buckeye courts are in somewhat of a, a valley there with homes on both sides that are elevated. Uh, so the recommendation to you is to consider authorizing $10,000 to complete a sound study. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, do you see that? the yes, we do. Buckeye location. So we would look at a sound study. We look at two different options up at uh, Buckeye. One would be to convert the two uh, courts, courts one and two located closest to the parking lot into eight pickleball courts. Those uh, courts are surrounded by more mature trees and a little bit further from, from homes. They would look at uh, options such as uh, artificial treatments like acoustic blankets, sound barriers, sound walls, also evaluate the impact of a shade covering and what kind of treatments could be added to a shade covering uh, to mitigate sound. The other location uh, possibility would be courts seven and eight. As you can see, those are a little bit closer to uh, homes and there's not as many trees around there. So uh, there would have to be some different treatments, although an option with this, uh, it would be to cover just one section of the courts, either um, court seven or court eight. How they do the sound study, they would, uh, we would have arrange for play on those courts, uh, try and maximize play. They would set up sound receptors uh, at the various neighborhoods within uh, proximity um, to the courts. We would, they measure ambient noise for a period of up to 24 hours. And then they uh, have a period of about an hour with peak play going on. And then they're able, from that information, able to simulate uh, a number of different scenarios uh, in, in doing their analysis and proposing mitigation options. Once we have that information, uh, we can look at what design options are possible. So this is a, a step in the process and it would give the planning committee and the board ultimately a little more information for comparative purposes between uh, Creekside and Buckeye locations. Any questions? Uh, Ted? Uh, at the current location right now, we are expanding that to four courts uh, and, and we have talked about this in the past with the, being able to expand from there would be very difficult to get it up to larger. Is there a reason why we're looking at the, at the study for eight courts instead of duplicating what we have the four courts up there and it would only be taking, there would be a one court that would be utilized instead of taking one fourth of tennis away from them on two courts. Because you know, you know what I mean. It just—I'm trying to figure out why we're going to eight instead of four when four was okay at Creekside. Well, certainly a, an option would be to just do four courts at Buckeye. But uh, if you're doing a sound study, you might as well look at eight because I can pretty much guarantee you that once you have four, there's going to be pressure to move to eight at Buckeye. Um, if, if you talk to any 
communities where they have converted tennis courts into uh, pickleball. It starts with one court and quickly goes to two courts. And um, there's a lot of pressure to it continuously expand. So if you're going to study something like the impact of sound, I would certainly recommend you you start with the eight courts and then you can scale back if, if you uh, ultimately decide only to build four. Would the sound study be able to say what it is with four and what it is with eight when they do it? Or is it all go- just going to be, here's what it would be maxed out? You could probably simulate uh, what four would be and then expand it to eight. Okay, thank you. Okay, Carl, Kathleen, and then Dale. Yes, one of the problems with the what it sounds like their procedure is is the way dB meters work. They do sound averaging, which means they average that peak pong sound with all of the quiet time between. And many of the of the uh, pickleball studies have shown that the pickleball it, it used when it's measured with dB meters is innocuous, sometimes even below background sound. However, the only real test, and like they did with the paddle test, is they may measure peak dB as opposed to to averaging decibels, which you usually get with a decibel meter. And anything above the peak decibels reaching above background noise is essentially an arbitrary value. So I'm questioning how this study will be conducted because in the past, a lot of these studies that have used dB meters show that the sound is innocuous, and then you suddenly get a lot of neighborhood complaints because the peak sound actually does exceed, and it's very irritating to have a loud sound in the midst of silence. The re- report from the acoustic consultant uh, is, is pretty detailed in regards to providing what the peak sound is uh, during during play for various levels. Uh, the company that we use for Creekside and that we would use for this has done other pickleball uh, studies, so they are very familiar with the sports. Um, they completed the study up at Lincoln Hills, so I, I would defer to their expertise in being able to uh, understand the, the implications of expanding play. And if they okay. say it's okay, are they willing to pay for the costs of installing and then removing the courts if it proves false? No, they would not be. So we would, we would, we have to accept responsibility for interpreting their results. They will not stand by their results. Is that correct? I I, I feel like we're getting into a a debate over a a technical issue and, and how uh, report would be prepared. This company has done reports for other communities. Uh, they would provide recommendations based on their uh, professional observation and, and results. Um, I believe they would stand by those uh, outcomes, but how we choose to uh, implement their recommendations would, would be a, a decision of the board. Uh, Okay, so moving on, Uh, Kathleen and Dale. Um, Okay, so um, having heard uh, some of the comments from the tennis players today and pickleball players uh, in the resident forum, um, I I agree with with, uh, what they're saying. I think that spending money on a sound um, study for Buckeye is a waste of money because um, I don't think it should be at Buckeye uh, even uh, if the sound study comes back and says, well, you know, you could probably uh, mitigate the sound. Um, Part of it is that you're talking about covering um, the courts 
at Buckeye to be able to keep the sound from going up the hills, which is, I think, one of the major considerations. And if you do that, then why aren't we just covering the course at, uh, at, at Creekside? I think that we um, can work with what the county said and, um, and as Jeff said, the possibilities for uh, Creekside are, have not been eliminated based on the report from the, uh, from the, the city. And um, so I'm not in favor of spending this money for um, something uh, that um, I'm not in favor of in, in the, the whole idea of Buckeye in the first place. Okay, Dale and then Leanne. Dale. Yeah, the, the, uh, from what I've read and heard uh, regarding Buckeye, the interest uh, expressed is not sound mitigation it's lack of sound. In other words, no pickleball sound at all. And it's interesting that in all of the discussions we've had, it's been the sound of hitting balls. We uh, live in uh, Buckeye and yelling is something we hear all the time. And that's, not, that's on the tennis courts. I'm sure that pickleballers yell also. Okay, Leanne? I would just rhetorically ask the board to consider <clears throat> how they would answer residents, similar to discussions I've had, who, um, how they feel about choosing an option, say Creekside, which may exceed the 1.2 million allocated for that site without investigating the possibility of another site. Um, I understand the controversy completely, but there's a due diligence element here. And I think that has to be considered in just doing an initial sound study just to possibly rule it out or investigate it. Um, I would just think about the due diligence of the decision. Okay, uh, Carl. Did you want to make a motion, Carl? Uh, yes. Uh, if you were talking about alternatives, I proposed an alternative to the planning committee of putting six courts north of that. That was never even considered by the planning committee, and I I never got a good reason why not. If in fact we terrace this, we would dramatically release both the environmental impact as well as the cost. And I have no idea how it costs. I have no idea if it's feasible. If we're talking about uh, other- Carl, let me interrupt you for a second. Your, that proposal was considered by the planning committee and by, the, um, by ELS, as I recall, and was not a feasible um, issue and voted down. I and did that's not why hear the, that it was evaluated by ELS. Well, and Jeff, I'm going to look to you there. So, but. Yeah, we, we actually did a, a schematic or a, you know, a layout plan showing um, additional courts to the, the north. And the, the plan as presented by uh, Director Brown was on the planning committee agenda and discussed by the planning committee. And I believe you were in attendance during that meeting. And it was and it was turned down. That, that's why we're at the current location at Creekside as the only viable. Uh, Kathleen, did you want to make a motion? Uh, well, uh, <laughs> the motion I would make is that we do not spend the um, up to $10,000 for a sound study uh, at um, Buckeye. Is there a second on that? I second. Okay. Any discussion? I think we're ready for a vote. Roll call, please. I'm sorry. Uh, could I interrupt? So uh, I, um, yes. Motion four, a, a, a vote four is would be not to. Not spend the money. Not to spend the money. Not right. to do the, the acoustical study, right. Roll call. Certainly. Walker? No. Sempo? Yes. Amaji? No. Kurt? No. Bentley? No. Brown? 
Yes. Clarity? Neva, you're muted. Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? No. The nose have it. Okay, so do we have another motion? Carl, did you want to uh, make a motion? I see your oh, hand. Sure. Oh, okay. Uh, Paul? I'd like to make a motion to authorize the and uh, staff to um, have a sound study produced for the Buckeye tennis courts to examine the possibility of pickleball at both locations as presented. Um, court yeah, that's seven a long motion. Are you done? Are you court seven and eight and courts one and two? And while I have the floor, wait, um, wait a second. Do we have a second on that motion? I'll second. I'll second. Mary, I Mary Heard is seconding that. And Deborah would like you to repeat the motion, Paul. Um, to authorize a sound study be performed at the Buckeye Tennis Courts to um, investigate both proposed or locations, courts one and two, as well as courts seven and eight. Okay. And Mary, that's your understanding of the motion? Okay. That's fine. Okay. Okay. Tim? Yeah, uh, you should specify the dollar amount in your motion. Uh, not to exceed 10000 Is that appropriate? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. And Mary, you're okay with that? Yes. Okay, great. And Paul, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I'd like, I take some exception to some of the comments from the, um, the residents forum, especially with regard to um, Leanne Hamaji's. Um, she is a dedicated member of the board uh, I have never known her to act in any way other than in the best interests of the board and the community. And um, I, I want to, uh, and we're talking about um, people being considerate of one another and not making personal attacks. And I think the first step in doing that is to recognize that we have the responsibility to do that. No one other than us can save us from ourselves. Paul, let me add to that, that uh, Leanne, upon joining the GRF, the GRF board, resigned uh, her position with the um, Pickleball Club and um, was no longer an officer. Yes, she was a member uh, of the club and uh, may still be, I don't know. Uh, but Leanne has done an outstanding job for us. Uh, any other uh, comments on regards to the motion? Okay, I think we're ready for a roll call, Deborah. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Sonfo? No. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? No. Clarity? No. Carrington? No. Madaraki? Yes. Carries. The motion. Okay, motion carries. Okay, uh, any other questions on that issue? So next up, um, and, and I'm, I'm thinking this might be a long discussion and maybe we want to move on to other agenda items and come back to this. Would everybody be okay with that? I am. Okay, then, then we will do that. Let's go to item C, 10C, uh, and Eric Wong, I think, is going to give us an update on whether mandatory masking and testing should still be required for unvaccinated staff. Hi, Eric. Hi. Good morning, everybody. You caught me off guard there, but uh, <laughs> I was listening. I went out of order. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. So I, I want to bring up a topic for board for review and discussion this morning. Um, at the end of April, the California Public Department of Health came out with a new ruling on masks, which basically rescinded their requirement for uh, unvaccinated employees to or 
individuals to requiring masks to saying that whether you're vaccinated or not, the, their changes to making that um, uh, a, a strong recommendation. So, you know, there've been changes since then. You know, I think as we've gone through this virus, it's, it's been interesting to see that um, it doesn't affect only those that are unvaccinated. If I take a look at some of the numbers, and I ran this beginning of third quarter from last year. So from October 1st to present, uh, we have had 37 positive cases here at GRF. Um, of those 37, only eight of those are unvaccinated. So I know that there are discussions on both sides of the fence, both within GRF and in the world out there about masks and whether or not we should have it. But um, when it comes to mask and testing, we have some control over the decisions that are made. And so I really wanna bring this to the board uh, to review, to discuss whether or not it's time to uh, allow uh, employees, all employees, regardless of vaccination status, as, as the, the new health order says, um, if they're required to wear a mask or if they don't have to. Um, and then also regards to the weekly testing as well too. The, the guidelines on that, and I actually called and spoke to somebody at the county regarding are these things mandatory, and except for certain industries like healthcare, um, they leave that up to the employers based on the needs. The employers can always go above and beyond what the requirements are, but there are no mandates that would be reflected at, at, at uh, directed towards GRF that we would have to require vaccinations or testing. That's a decision that we would make um, as our own organization. So, so that's what I want to bring forward today for your, your thoughts and deliberation and discussion. Okay, hey, any questions for Eric? Uh, Carl? Yes, I, I think that uh, I, I don't see the testing is really advantageous since a person tends to be more contagious prior to the test. And if we do it weekly, uh, I, I don't see the r real point in testing. However, masking is another thing. Okay, uh, Kathleen, Leanne, and Mary. So I have a question. <clears throat> you said out of uh, 30 odd cases that um, eight were unvaccinated. And do you have uh, information on how serious the illness was? Because of course, it's much more contagious if you're seriously ill than if you um, have something that really has no, no symptoms. Do you have any information on that? I can tell you that for those who were, were who tested positive, uh, we followed the same guidance in terms of their quarantine, number of quarantine days, and then testing again to make sure that they were negative before they came back. No one that we've had needed to extend beyond the the initial time frame of that five days that they recovered. And so were they, I guess to answer your question, were they serious cases? Not in that regard. Nobody ended up in emergency. Um, they went through it. You know, most of the, the the conversations I've had with employees who have had it said, you know, they they didn't either they were either asymptomatic or it was very mild that they've had worse colds and flus beyond this most recent round. Uh, Leanne. Yeah, back in February, we as a board voted to stay parallel to the county guidelines. So I think in this regard, we need to stay parallel to the county guidelines and um, allow, not insist on ma uh, unvaccinated employees masking. Carl, did you have a comment? Okay. Uh, do, is anybody prepared to make a motion? Can I, are we ready for a motion? Now, Leanne? Yes, I make a motion that we no longer require unvaccinated employees to be masked. I'll second. Okay, and you didn't mention um, testing. Did you want to include that or make that a separate motion? Hmm. I would like that to be a second motion because I'd like some discussion on that. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second. You want to repeat the motion just so that we're all clear? 
Yes, I make the motion to no longer require unvaccinated employees to be masked. Okay. All right. Uh, Kathleen. You're, you're muted, Kathleen. Okay. So I just want to say um, that if, um, as they talk about another surge coming, that we could um, discuss this again at a later date and, and change the requirement. Of course. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, uh, I, we're ready for a roll call. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumpo. Yes. Bamaji. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Brown. No. Clarity. No. Harrington. Yes. Madaraki. Yes. Carries. Okay, and do we have another motion in regards to testing? Can I ask somebody to make a motion on testing? Ted? I make a motion that we no longer require testing on a weekly basis for our un unvaccinated staff. I second. Okay, so Dale seconded that. Any discussion? Leanne. Eric, do we have a number of how many unvaccinated employees we currently have? We do. We have 18 currently. 18. Are they in front office or person to person positions? Uh, it's a mixture throughout the different departments in a mixture. Okay. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Kathleen. Well, I guess I have to comment. Uh, so if 18, are if 18 are unvaccinated and eight of them have already <laughs> gotten the uh, vaccine, that only leaves 10 that are susceptible. So that's not very, mon very many considering. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Deborah, we're ready for a roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Stumpo? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, what was that? Yes. Thank you very much. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Eric, thank you very much for your report on that. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Uh, new business. Uh, so Jeff, I think you're going to talk to us about database integration and some additional work that needs to be done. Yes, so we are been working on the implementation of the new access control uh, systems that the board has authorized uh, over the past few years uh, in phase one and phase two. Uh, we are also continuing to work on the processes and implementation of our centralized database and the integration with uh, my Rossmore and with our various applications that we have. As you know, and we've reported uh, in, in working with our member management software, GenArc, uh, there are significant challenges in cleaning up that database and in uh, processing data that we need on individual members to flow through to the central database and make sure that all of our applications then are interconnected and receiving the same updates and information. In evaluating the uh, processes to implement the, the new access control and making sure it's properly integrated with our central database and uh, my Rossmore and that the information that we are sharing with uh, those various systems is accurate and, and updated uh, correctly, uh, we've begun to realize that uh, we would significantly benefit from a dedicated project manager for this project. 
uh, capacity within staff right now to uh, pull together the various aspects is, is very limited. Um, Joel has uh, reached out to a number of firms that provides this specialized service and uh, did some interviews, and we are recommending the firm of Bill, Bill Pilger and Mayor BPM at, uh, at an amount not to exceed 35000 the funds would come from the uh, already approved project funding for implementation of the access control system. So we're asking for authorization to uh, engage in a professional services agreement with BPM for an amount not to exceed 35,000. Okay. Uh, Mary and then Leanne. Uh, I move that the board authorize the CEO to execute an agreement with BPM for project management services for the implementation of the central database and access control systems with existing member management systems to be paid from the trust estate fund in an amount not to exceed 35000 And I second that. And that's well worded, Mary. Thank you. Uh, any discussions or questions? Uh, we are, uh, Carl. Carl, you're still muted. Car Carl, you're muted. Carl, for some reason, you're not coming off mute. Okay. There you are. I would yeah, say anything we can do to clean up GenArc will benefit other systems and, and uh, reports as well. Excellent. Any other comments? If not, Deborah, I think we're ready for a roll call. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Stumpel. Yes. Kamaji. Yes. Kurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Brown. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Madaraki. Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. And by the way, everybody, I apologize. I, I scrolled up on my screen, uh, maybe trying to uh, make for a shorter meeting, but I forgot other unfinished business. So let's go back up to 10A, item 10A, uh, considering the revised rule on the golf course. This is the second reading. I don't think Mark is here, uh, but this was reviewed at the last uh, board meeting. The policy committee had, a, had approved it. Um, are there any questions or is there a motion? Leanne. I just have one question on the, in the general rules section, number four, shouldn't it say or surrounding homes? Currently it says four surrounding homes. I believe that was a, a typo that we would catch. Okay, good. Okay, uh, Dale. Yes, I make a motion that we revise rule R103.0 golf course uh, as recommended by the policy committee that had been deferred February 24, 2022. Okay, is there a second? Okay. I'll Mary, second. Mary Hurd seconded. Thank you. Any further discussion? Uh, Deborah, roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Dunfo? Yes. Amaji? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Madaraki? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you very much. Item 10B, uh, discussion regarding uh, returning to in-person meeting for the board and separately then for committees. Uh, Mary? Dwight, if it's okay, I'd like to put a motion on the table and then we can uh, go ahead and do the uh, discussion. Is that okay? Yes, you bet. I move that the GRF board begin holding in-person and hybrid meetings in the Peacock Theater effective April 28, and that committees begin holding in-person and hybrid meetings as soon as the electronic setup in the boardroom at Gateway is in place. Is there a second to that? Ted? 
Okay, I second. Ted has seconded that. Uh, Deborah, you had a question? Uh, if Mary would be so kind as to type up that motion and send that to me, I would certainly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, Leanne. Yeah, I had a question about the carts. So in the board packet, it talks about, um, in one section it talks about two quarts, carts, and in the other section it talks about three carts. And um, maybe we're not at a point where we're talking about voting on carts yet. Never mind. Are we? I'm a little confused hmm. about where we are here. <laughs> well, well, Tim, do we uh, want to talk about carts at this time? So let, let me let me just give you a, a quick overview of, of what that means if we're going to have a hybrid meeting. So um, the you authorized a while back an upgrade to the boardroom at Gateway to um, install a, additional media components, which would allow us to have a, a hybrid meeting. Now, a hybrid meeting means that we have a live meeting in person with the ability of people to participate via Zoom. Now, the challenge with that is that if you have more than one microphone in a room on Zoom, there's a horrible uh, feedback loop that you, it's a squeal that you, you can't conduct your meeting. And that, that's just the technology with Zoom when you have more than one microphone in a room on Zoom at the same time. So what you have right now is you're all independent of each other. You're in separate rooms throughout Rossmore and you don't have that feedback problem. But if we were all in the same room on our laptops or our cell phones on Zoom, we would have that problem. So the equipment that is in the process of being installed, uh, it's an, I, the latest update was that we still have a little, there's some more parts that were there's hung up in the supply chain you know, conundrum. Um, but most of it is ready to go, although it's not fully operational yet. Now that is only for the boardroom. Meetings, governance meetings for GRF's board and committees take place in other rooms. The boardroom is where most of the committee meetings take place, but not all of them. For example, all of the recreational advisory committees, aquatics, golf, and fitness, all have scheduled their meetings. I believe they're all now at Creekside. So Creekside does not have, uh, you know, the capabilities to, to do exactly what we would have, what we're setting up for in the boardroom. In addition, there are often conflicts with the boardroom between GRF and the mutuals. Uh, conflicts meaning scheduling conflicts. And so what happens is GRF or the mutuals end up getting moved to another space. Uh, so the MPR rooms, the multi-purpose rooms at Gateway are often used for that. The other rooms at Creekside are often used for that. And on occasion, even Hillside is used for that. So in order to have a functioning hybrid meeting, a Zoom meeting in, you know, concurrently with the live meeting, we need additional technology to do that. So what you saw in your packet is um, uh, Joe Brzezinski, our IT manager, has, has researched this and found a semi-mobile platform that has a large screen TV mounted on a frame on wheels with a camera and a sound bar. And uh, in addition, uh, we would likely have to have a couple of extra mics. And the way this particular product is set up is you would have, we, we would likely need three additional mics. And these are noise canceling mics, but they only work in, in proximity in a 15 foot radius or, or thereabouts. So they, the way the technology for that works is that it would not interfere having multiple microphones in the room on Zoom. So that way, residents, uh, anybody attending the meeting, uh, you know, a Zoom hybrid meeting would be able to participate. But these setups are not cheap. They're, they're quite expensive. Uh, I, think, uh, the, I think it was $8,500 is I think the number, yeah, $8,500. So the recommendation is that we would probably need two, 
a minimum of two, one for gateway so it can move around the gateway complex to different rooms and the other at Creekside. And really we should have a third, which would we would have located up at Hillside. Even though these are mobile, they're on wheels. I don't think, you know, an $8,500 piece of equipment or pieces of equipment shouldn't be put in a truck and moved from venue to venue. I think it's just, that's just a guarantee that something's going to break. So um, it's, you know, troublesome enough to wheel it from, say, um, the, the Redwood room or the Fireside room and then wheel it down to the MPR room. That's a long distance. It's, I don't know, 150 feet, maybe 200 feet. So it's a long way to go. But at least it's on wheels. It can be done. It doesn't happen that often where the committee meetings have to move to another room. Uh, but it, it does happen yeah, a couple times a year, pretty much for every committee. So um, because there's just going to be scheduling conflicts. When, when, when you have, for example, a meeting on the last day of a month, let's say, and the mutual has a meeting on the fourth day of the month, that's when these kinds of conflicts typically come up is that there's sometimes five weeks in a month and other times there's not. And so that's when these scheduling conflicts end up bumping a, um, a, a, a committee or a governing body to another venue um, temporarily before they can move back to the other venue, which is typically the boardroom. So, so the proposal here is if we want to go to hybrid meetings, uh, the staff recommendation, uh, oh, and I should say also that we co- these are called Zoom media carts is what this thing is called. So uh, it, it, I don't mean to disparage anyone, including staff or board members or committee chairs, but what will happen in a hybrid meeting is that th- these are not going to, we're not going to have technical staff available to troubleshoot. Uh, technical difficulties that participants may have uh, logging into Zoom or whatever, or unmuting their microphone on those kinds of things. So the people who have to do that will be the, the committee chair and the staff liaison. Now, our staff liaisons are not IT professionals or tech, technologists. So, you know, we're, we're just like you guys, we're going to struggle through it. If you follow the um, city of Walnut Creek's uh, council meeting this week, they went to a live meeting and, and a hybrid meeting, and they spent, I'm told, more than 20 minutes at the start of the meeting trying to overcome the technical difficulties. So as Deborah will say, she experiences that regularly at the various meetings that she's trying to assist with people that are struggling, whether it's committee members or people that are calling in or Zooming in. That are, that are having difficulty logging in. So she often is off camera or off microphone trying to help those people get connected. And you heard that today. There were, what, three, three or four different callers today that called into the meeting that were unable to activate their microphone. So, so that's, a, that's an issue. Now, the Zoom media carts makes it somewhat dummy proof, according to Joe Brzezinski. And Joe is here. I know he's available to answer any technical questions around this. But it's, I'm told, I haven't seen it demonstrated, but I'm told that all we have to do is wheel the thing into the room, plug it in, turn it on, push the button, and the Zoom is ready to go. And hopefully without technical problems. But, you know, there's always going to be a glitch now and again. So, So the recommendation is that if you want to go to a hybrid meeting that we invest in a minimum of one, probably two, and we recommend three Zoom carts. So we have one at each of the three clubhouses where these meetings generally take place, Creekside, Gateway, and Hillside. Okay, thanks for that background. There is a motion on the floor. Why don't we repeat that motion? Uh, Deborah, do you have that? I do. The, oh, Mary, Mary uh, like, I had yes. it. What I'd like to do is amend the motion. I'll read it as as including the purchase of the three carts each at eighty five hundred dollars. Okay. Okay. So you're going to I move that the GR. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go right ahead. I move that the GRF board began holding in person hybrid meetings in the Peacock Theater effective April twenty eighth and that committees began holding in-person hybrid meetings as soon as the electronics set up in the boardroom and other gateway, it's, it's boardroom, Creekside and Hillside are in place. 
I authorized the purchase of three Zoom cards at $8,500 each. And who seconded I'll, that? I I'll second that. And Mary, oh. could you also stipulate whether, so this, this qualifies to be treated as coming out of the uh, trust the state fund if you choose to. If you don't want it to come out of the trust the state fund, it comes out of the operating fund. This is an, this is an, un, come out of it's an unbudgeted operating expense if you have it come out of the operating fund. I prefer that it come out of the trust estate fund. So purchase from the trust estate fund. <laughs> okay, so who originally seconded uh, Mary's motion? Was that? Ted. Do you remember, that was, Deborah? That was Ted. Ted. Ted, do you agree to those changes? Yes. Okay, okay, great. Uh, so we have some comments here. Carl, uh, Dale, Mary, and Kathleen. Just unmute. And uh, one of the things is I'm a little concerned about the theater layout at Peacock and the fact that people have to squeeze past each other and can't maintain proper distance. I think people, some people may be reticent to do it. So I would like to amend the motion that at least for now, we check vaccination status of people attending Peacock because other people would be able to, to participate by Zoom. Uh, somebody needs to mute their cat. Not sure who that is, but uh, Mary, so uh, Carl is proposing an amendment to your motion. Are you willing to uh, make that amendment? No, I don't think I am, Carl. I, I think that the idea here is that if we have to have people checking vaccination status and then sending people away, to me, the option is if you don't want to be in concert with other people, you can use Zoom. That's why, to me, the hybrid function works so well. And I remember listening to many residents who said the attendance has gone up because of Zoom. So to me, people who don't want to be in attendance have a very viable option. Okay, Tim, you have a comment? Yeah, I... So if I, I'm going to deviate here just for a moment, and I because I did not address Peacock Hall, uh, since Carl's brought up Peacock Hall, let me just talk about that facility because that's different than everywhere else. How we will handle a hybrid meeting. So you, those of you that were on the board, well, I think it would be all of you who were on the board last June, when we just momentarily had our first in-person meeting in in at that point in in a year and a half. And uh, when the health orders were lifted and then they were shortly thereafter reinstated and then we, we didn't have any more in-person meetings. So at Peacock Hall, we have, um, in order to have a hybrid meeting, we had, to, we had to resolve that issue on the feedback and the noise and whether or not we would all have laptops in the room. And we, that, that's when we discovered that it could not be overcome. It's actually a technological issue with Zoom. So, uh, but what, what we settled on, if you recall, was having channel 28, we bought a piece of equipment that allows us to ha create an interface between Zoom and the channel 28 broadcasting equipment. And so it eliminated the feedback sound uh, in Peacock Hall, but it also meant that we didn't have a Zoom screen in front of us. Now that you, were, you know that the, the people participating that are calling in on Zoom, uh, we do not turn on, activate their cameras. So it's just their microphone. So uh, that then interfaced with the sound system in Peacock Hall. So we were able to do both the broadcast on channel 28 and YouTube, uh, the sound system, so we could all hear the participants that were calling in through Zoom on our sound system in Peacock Hall. And then the camera was, was not your laptop camera. It was a, the single camera that is operated by the channel 28 staff. So uh, Peacock is different than all the other venues because the boardroom and any other room meeting space that we would put the Zoom media cart, as I said earlier, it would be up to the committee chair and the staff liaison to have to navigate whatever the technical issues are in those meetings. But at Peacock, it's unique in that we have the Channel 28 staff uh, available to handle the technical issues in that room. Now, in terms of vaccination status, that's the question I know that Carl just put on the table. So I'll let you continue to deliberate that, but I just wanted to clarify how the technology would work in Peacock, which is different than all the other venues. 
Okay, so uh, Mary did not accept uh, Carl's amendment, but is there a second to Carl's amendment? Okay, so uh, that fails, we move on. Uh, Dale, Kathleen, and Paul. Uh, I propose that a committee chair be permitted to hold a committee meeting exclusively on Zoom. And if we did that, then that would eliminate the problem that Tim brought up of multiple demands for, let's say, the boardroom. So I, as a, as I may not be the the policy committee chair next next time around, but as I am right now, I would like to be able to have the um, authority to be able to hold my meetings exclusively on Zoom. So you're proposing an amendment to Mary's motion, is that correct? Well, I, I don't know whether it would have to be an amendment to her motion or it could be a separate one, I, wh whatever is the best way to do it. I don't know. Well, well, if you make an amendment or propose an amendment, we'll look for a second. So are you proposing an amendment? Yes, okay. Okay, is there a second to that? Second. Carl? second. And, Mary, and Eva, okay. Uh, Mary, are you willing to, <laughs> no, wait a second, <laughs> Deborah, help me here. So we have to vote on this proposed yes. amendment? So Dale, uh, where would you like your amendment inserted into the previously noted original motion? I would, uh, oh. I would think uh, Deborah, Maybe Co it could. hold on. Point point of order. So Mary hasn't accepted an amendment to that. She does motion. not need to. When you have an amendment that comes before, you uh -huh. can make a motion to amend the regular motion, and it's, if someone seconds it, you have to make a motion and vote on that. Oh, so that we, we don't amendment. vote on the proposed amendment. We don't mm -hmm. vote on the proposed amendment. You you yes, you vote on the motion as amended. Okay. If that is shut down, then it goes back to the original motion. Okay. Dale, and do you uh, want to rescind Deborah, that motion? Deborah, hey, Dale, do you want to re Dale, do you want to rescind that motion and make it, we'll do it a separate motion? Okay. Oh, is that, that all right? That would be fine. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. okay. Carl, you okay with that? All right. Good. Yes. Kathleen and Paul. Kathleen and Paul. So we're back <laughs> to the original motion. Uh, okay. So now I'm uh, like... Uh, I got to get my head back on where I was. Okay, so, um, so I would like to consider. I know it's important for um, the uh, board meetings um, to have access to other people. I think we had 123 people participating in in this meeting, um, but uh, I don't know if it's been explored that the board couldn't meet in the um, uh, in the boardroom not at Peacock, and then have the Zoom uh, with everyone uh, participating by a Zoom instead of in Peacock where some people would be in the room and some people would be on Zoom. Um, I, I don't know if that's been explored. And um, I also think um, while I have the floor that the uh, I'm not so sure about committee meetings. So I, I would kind of like that to be a separate um, issue. Uh, I don't know how many people attend the uh, committee meetings. And I, so I don't know if it's important to spend money on, um, on having the hybrid committee meetings, um, you know, in the committees that I'm on, there's really never anybody but the, but the committee there. Um, and I don't know if that's true for, for other committees or not. Don't take it personally, Kathleen. Uh, Tim. <laughs> Tim. So, so the boardroom, so I don't, I'm not sure exactly what the capacity will be with it, or if it's any different with the new equipment in there. It probably isn't. Um, but the, um, uh, although there have to be a space for the camera to, to film the board. So um, the boardroom gets maximized fairly quickly. It, it doesn't have a lot of space. So 
when you have your nine board members, there, there actually isn't a place to put nine people all, say, at the head of the table, so to speak. You, you're kind of in a U shape if you're a member of the room. I know we haven't had a live meeting in a long time, so some of you probably have never even been into the boardroom for, for any kind of governance meeting. Um, so it's fairly limited. The best we can do uh, and the most we probably have crammed in there on a regular basis is for the president's forum. And that is about 35 people. It's not, a, it's not an ideal setup. And in fact, the presidents have been reluctant to, to meet again in that room. It's just you're, too, you're crammed in there too much, at least during the pandemic. Uh, they didn't want to have uh, or have so far been reluctant to gather in that room. In fact, they've asked us to find a larger space so they can spread out more, even with the pandemic, hopefully on its last legs here. So, uh, so they're going to have their future meetings down at Creekside in a larger room down there where people can spread out more. So uh, when you look at the nine of you, Deborah and I, that's 11. And then you've got, I think, uh, seven or eight other senior managers that are always in attendance. So right there, you're looking at just about 20 people. Then um, that's that's too many. It's too many for the boardroom. The, the capacity just isn't quite there. Like I said, we, we did have about 35 there for president's forum meetings. Um, some are seated around the table and others are seated in the chairs with their backs up against the wall on either side. And it gets very, very crowded in there. That's it's just way too crowded. Well, so so I don't think that boardroom would be a good venue for board for GRF board meetings just because just the staffing and the board members alone take the room to capacity there wouldn't be any room for residents to come in uh, right so my idea would would be that there would be the uh the nine uh, uh directors uh you and deborah and um i have a feeling that the uh, senior staff might be just as happy being on zoom because it when it's not their part of the presentation they could be um, you know on their computer doing something else so um and the so residents have, would all be on Zoom. So I, I don't. So this is not really in the motion. Can we? This is a discussion that could take place at another time about venues. Can we? Can we move on and just discuss well, it, the motion? I, I think it is part of the motion. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, sort of okay. debating whether this motion is viable or not. Okay. Anyway, so that's my thought. Okay, Paul. Um, we're talking about three, um, shall we call them hybrid carts, and um, for three specific locations, what about the event center, where uh, some of the, at least the first mutual board, that's where its meeting is, and why aren't we considering another cart for up there? which would give us more flexibility and also accommodate the meetings that are already there. So the, the event center I'm told is maximally booked there. We would not be able to schedule GRF board meetings on board meeting days at the event center. Uh, however, the, uh, just so you know, the event center does have the capability to, you know, we could have, it is set up for recording and audio and video. So we could have a similar setup, I'm told, at the event center. But the problem is that uh, actually it's one a question that we actually looked into is that the the room's not available for GRF board meetings. Uh, uh, though, Tim, I think Paul is saying for committee meetings or other organizations that want to have a hybrid meeting, can they do that at the event center? Same thing. The event center is pretty much fully booked. Um, Deborah is nodding her head. I, I know she did some legwork on looking into that. Yes. So um, I reached out to the reservation um, desk and spoke to the manager of the recreation department. Uh, we typically book out our uh, committee meeting rooms for the GRF board and its advisory committees in August for the following year. So at this point, think- all of the rooms are booked. I know, but I think Paula is saying, what if Mutual One wants to have a hybrid meeting because they meet at the event center? Is there a capability there for that? There is a capability for, sorry. Yeah, so 
that would have to be handled differently because we don't have Channel 28 staff available to support the mutuals uh, for their meetings. Uh, but the um, the so there is another option with technology that we talked about last summer, and and we have implemented. And that is, uh, as I understand it, a laptop, a manual or remote camera, and a microphone that can move relatively easily from room to room. The challenge is that it 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 would ha might have difficulty picking up sound in a large. In fact, I know it wouldn't pick up the sound in a large space. It works best in a small room uh, or small-ish room. You could probably do it at the fairway room perhaps it might be the largest room that it might work in I, we'd have to check with the recreation department to see which rooms clubs have taken advantage of that and i know that it, the option was made available to the mutuals as well but i i don't believe any mutuals have have taken advantage of it just some clubs have taken advantage of that of that camera and laptop that can and microphone that can move around okay all right did that answer your question paul Okay, um, so we have a motion on the floor. I kind of forget what it is at this point in time. Mary, you want to repeat that motion? You're muted. There you Here go. we go. I move that the GRF board began holding in-person hybrid meetings in the Peacock Theater effective April 28th and that committees began holding in-person hybrid meetings as soon as the electronic setup in the boardroom at Gateway and um, Creekside and Hillside are set up. I, let's see, let me read this. Soon. I authorize, I request the purchase of three Zoom cards at 8,500 each paid from the trust estate fund. Close enough? Yep, that sounds very familiar. Leanne? I'm in favor of that, but I just think that the line regarding committees moving to hybrid meetings should say, just the wording should be changed to may, because they may not want to. I think that's going to be a separate motion. We're going to discuss that after this. Let, let's okay. vote on this motion as it exists. Okay. Roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Stumpo? No. Amanti? Yes. Mary? William? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Brown? No. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. And Madaraki? Yes. Carries. Okay. Thank you very much. So now let's, do, let's talk about committees options. Somebody want to, Dale, did you want to make a motion? Yes. My motion is that a committee chair uh, be allowed to choose to have their committee meeting be exclusively on Zoom. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second it. Okay, Kathleen, second to that. Any discussions? Tim, so the, Tim. we have a we have a policy. Dale's the chair of the policy committee. Just so uh, you'll have to do a little more work on this. There is a policy that requires you to have in-person meetings for all your governance mm -hmm. meetings. It it does give the board the ability to operate remotely, like if you're traveling. It actually prohibits you from having a meeting like uh, um, a teleconference meeting. Uh, say if you're not traveling, if you're at home. So the, the, I've forgotten exactly how the language is worded, but it, it does restrict that. So what you'll want to do to have hybrid meetings or Zoom meetings on any with any regularity, I guess I should have said this in the last discussion, I, I forgot about it. Um, you'll want to eventually have this, or at, maybe at the conclusion of this discussion, have this referred back to the policy committee to re to revise, take a look at the particular policy where this is discussed, just to allow you, so you're not restricted, because there's clearly interest, I think, here on the board of having, continuing with the hybrid and Zoom meetings. Uh, I did check with our attorney whether you could 
actually have, whether you had the option of having Zoom meetings or teleconference meetings. And the old language was teleconference. That's how, how the policy sure. was written. Um, Zoom is a newer phenomenon. Um, and he said that there is nothing in the bylaws or the law that prohibits you from doing that. Uh, we, we used the governor's executive order, emergency order around the pandemic back in March of 2020. He's, and we are still, as of through today, we are still in an emergency order um, situation from the state of California. And that order doesn't necessarily apply to us. It applies to public agencies, cities, governments, and you know, that kind of thing. Um, but we used that as our justification to, um, to allow us to have electronic teleconferenced meetings and not meet in person. And based on the opinion of our attorney two years ago, that that was acceptable. So he said that there, if you want to, all you have to do is modify the policy to allow you to have ongoing electronic or Zoom or teleconference meetings, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, and the committee, the policy committee should decide whether you want any further restrictions on, on that. So, uh, so I just wanted to point that out that following this discussion, we'll want to turn this back to the policy committee to update that particular policy. And I'm sorry, I don't have the reference here. I'll have it in a moment. I don't have the policy number here in front of me, but uh, I'll look that up for you before we finish the discussion. Gail, yeah. did you want to modify your, uh, uh, your motion to refer it back to the policy committee for deliberation? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. And I mentioned the word Zoom. Uh, Tim, should we possibly, instead of using the word Zoom, use another more generic, generic uh, word? Well, Dale, you're just you're just referring it back to the to the policy committee, right? Ah, okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So it's not really a motion there. I don't think. Do you, Deborah, help me. There was a motion on the floor, so we need to rescind that motion. Yeah, and then Dale sorry, is recommending yeah. it goes Dale back to the Dale and Kathleen made a motion to hold exclusive meetings on Zoom to allow a committee chair. So, Dale, have you agreed to rescind that motion and refer it back to the policy committee meeting? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Ka Kathleen, are you okay with that? I'm fine. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Unless there were other comments in this subject, save them for the policy committee. Okay, um, it is 1216. We still have a few items to cover. Uh, let, me, let me just cover one more item of um, unfinished business and then we'll, or, or new business, and then we'll go back. I want to just update everybody on the letter writing campaign that we did for, um, with our, oops, <laughs> with our politicians, our elected representatives. So uh, most of you recall that we had meetings back in February. That was uh, Tim and uh, Mary or Neva and myself uh, with our elected representatives. And you have a list of them there. We have followed up on all of those with a, um, a letter asking for their support of the CONFIRE grant application of 4.9 million. And uh, I must tell you, very, very pleased that this week we received copies of letters from the city of Walnut Creek, city of Lafayette and the town of Moraga. They have all sent letters of uh, support to um, CAL FIRE and CON FIRE. Uh, so we're getting some good information uh, or good support for that uh, going forward. And that is a very good move for, uh, thanks to CON FIRE, uh, to provide more fire safety for Rossmore as well as uh, Lafayette and Moraga. Uh, any comments on that? Okay. So we will take, let's take a five minute break and we're gonna come back and talk about civility and facilities master plan. Okay. So um, 1222. Okay, uh, why, why don't we get restarted? Although I, see that Tim and Jeff are not here and we uh, really need Jeff at least um, to, to discuss the facilities master plan prioritization. There he is. So let's get back uh, in, in place here. Hey, just a reminder, when we go to break, um, 
put your put your mics on mute uh, so we don't necessarily hear your comments uh, as you leave the meeting. Uh, uh, Jeff, where are we on the facilities master plan? Okay, where are we? This has been uh, a significant undertaking for the, the community, the planning committee, and, and certainly the, the board. Um, this project has involved uh, a significant amount of community outreach and, and input. Uh, the consultant team of ELS has done uh, two workshops, two public workshops and held focus groups. We've done a survey, uh, all to generate interest and receive feedback on existing facilities, facility needs, projections into the future, um, and that effort was really to develop a list of potential projects that would meet uh, the, the community's needs over the next 10 years. Our initial effort was really focused on generating that list uh, and then prioritizing that list in terms of immediate need, uh, short-term and long-term need. And that effort was done without consideration initially of cost estimates. Uh, we wanted to see what the, the public and what the planning committee's interests were uh, based on the, the projects itself without any, any implication of cost. So through several exercises, the um, planning committee had an opportunity to review the list of projects that was generated and ultimately rank them and, and put them into uh, categories such as immediate need and, and long-term and, and so forth. Um, once that was done, we began the process of working with the finance committee. And that process included providing actual cost estimates for the various projects that were identified. Now keep in mind, these are, are very, very preliminary rough cost estimates. They are based on uh, limited information. They include uh, escalation and a, a variety of factors. Um, so they are not by any means considered a, a final cost of what a project may, may be. Um, as the scope uh, of a project is adjusted, uh, as more information is determined, those cost estimates can start to become more refined. Working with the Finance Committee, it became uh, certainly uh, clear that there was not available funding in the Trust Estate Fund to accomplish all that was desired or, or recognized through the initial uh, prioritization process. Uh, the Finance Committee had the opportunity to evaluate funding options such as increasing the membership transfer fee. They ultimately made the recommendation that you considered earlier and uh, that will uh, require some further consideration by the Finance Committee. Ultimately, what we'll be left with uh, at the conclusion of the uh, project is a list of projects over the next 10 years that can be accomplished, as well as a funding model that can be updated and adjusted on an annual basis based on uh, changing priorities, based on actual uh, expenditures, based on actual revenue generated from the membership transfer fee, uh, things such as the sale of the medical center and uh, realization of those resources and so forth. So it is meant to be a living document that is continuously updated. And as we roll forward beyond 10 years, new projects rolled in and adjustments made. At the last planning committee meeting, um, we had the opportunity to share the list of projects and the uh, potential resources based on the recommendation from planning or from finance of increasing the membership transfer fee. Right. Yeah, find my glasses here. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? 
Not really. No, <laughs> we can small. see your screen, but the numbers are very small. But we have it in our packet. Okay. So what is nine B two dash nine? Just so everybody knows. That's correct. Um, so what this gives you is the list of projects, and we went through uh, project by project, and staff made some recommendations on adjustments to the list of projects that ultimately would bring down the uh, list of projects and the uh, timing such that it would align with available resources based on that increase in the membership transfer fee. So for example, if we go down the list, uh, Peacock Plaza shade structure, originally the cost estimate was uh, 900,000. And the scope of that included uh, a permanent shade structure, new furnishings, new sound uh, and lighting systems, new permanent stage, and, and a variety of improvements to that whole area. Well, if, if you look at that project and you consider that the, the goal is really to create a, a town square and a, an atmosphere and, and a lot has to do with programming, you can certainly modify that project and bring down the scope significantly. Uh, the next project, interior and exterior accessibility for dollar, uh, that is a project that included uh, both looking at the uh, back patio area, but also some uh, initial improvements interior. That project can be broken up into smaller bites. So as a, a phase one in uh, 2023, you could do the back patio area, which has several elevation changes and the entry to the main house from the back patio is not to current accessibility code. So you can take care of those issues in, in a phase one. Uh, things like the studio renovation has already uh, been approved. Uh, the restroom renovation has been moved off um, and would be included in a overall renovation. The water reclamation project, project uh, five, this is one of the most significant projects that this community would undertake both in, in scope and cost uh, with a, an estimated construction cost of over $11 million. It is not a project that there is currently funding available to complete in the uh, near or intermediate term. So the, the recommendation is that that project be considered once uh, resources are realized from the sale of the medical center. Uh, it is not obligating that, but uh, it certainly is a possibility that once the medical center is complete, the sale of that, that those resources can be considered for the uh, water reclamation project. So at this Jeff, point... Jeff, Jeff yes. can I interrupt you there for a second? Sure. So there has been no board discussion, deliberation, or decision regarding proceeds from the medical center. And they could be used for a number of reasons, paying down debt, paying down pension liability, water reclamation, et cetera. Uh, I think it's premature and assumptive to say that we're going to be using proceeds from the medical center for water reclamation. That is, I, absol that is absolutely correct. So what this does is takes off the construction of this project and doesn't include it in any of the out years at this point. Once but, the sale takes place, but where is it? Where is it, Jeff? Where is the eleven? It would now? it would be basically a, a wish list item, and then once the the medical center does, and there are resources at that point in time, the board could decide to undertake that project, or as you mentioned, do other things with those resources and simply leave it on a wish list. And that, and that could be true with any of these projects. The, the board is not approving a specific project at this time or uh, exact timing. At, at any point, you can decide that, you know, the MOD garage uh, project is not something that you want to undertake or you want to undertake it in a different time schedule, for example, or uh, the Dollar Clubhouse renovation. This is, is really has to be a flexible planning tool that can be adjusted as you move forward. But Jeff, I just want to point out two things. One, 
the water reclamation, $11 million doesn't show up on this schedule at all. Shouldn't we list it somewhere? So it, it, it is listed as number five and the original estimate of 11.5 million is there. So what, what we would, but it's the X isn't there as being included. Uh, so we can move that down to the, a wish list item. However, you do have the 232,000 that has already been approved for this year and ongoing studies. I, I think it makes sense to show that in the wish list. That we could do that. Something that um, would make sense. I mean, the second thing I want to say is that yes, we could, we will be modifying this going forward, and it's a great planning tool. But we want to use this schedule, as pointed out earlier in the meeting, that it affects looking at the membership transfer fee, and and it also affects uh, taking on twenty nine million dollars worth of debt. I mean, there are there are financial implications here, revenue in, loans, et cetera that we need to be very, very careful in what we, we identify in the next 10 years as things that are feasible and setting expectations for our residents as well. So I didn't mean to interrupt your, your going through the list, but I just want us to be thinking about this a little more broadly than, um, than we might be at this point in time. So uh, continuing on, Walking paths certainly were high on the list of uh, interest from the community through the survey and through input at the workshops. However, it, that was also during a time of the pandemic when other opportunities for uh, exercise and, and outlets were not available. And certainly there are opportunities throughout the valley for walking on improved sidewalks, trails, and uh, through the mutuals. So that project had been moved to the wish list or recommended to move to the wish list, uh, both phase one and phase two. Uh, the Bocce improvements um, in Sportsman's Park, the Bocce uh, surfacing had been improved, but the other improvements would be in the wish list. Um, item. Access control, uh, and that reflects what has been uh, approved thus far in the 145,000. Uh, the all-in cost, there will be one more phase for that. Uh, however, some of those items you will see will show up under the Rossmore capital budget, which is uh, down further in the spreadsheet. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. The new MOD office building, there are two components to that right now as envisioned. One is relocating the garage and warehouse to the upper lot and then being able to expand the office complex and uh, improving flow of traffic and parking and trying to address the main issue of uh, operations interface with uh, a public uh, entry and parking area. So trying to separate those. There are two significant components to this. I would say that once you get closer to this project, you would definitely want to do uh, evaluation of the best options for completing the interest for uh, the office building. Um, there in, in the master plan, there will be some alternative options that you can consider. But uh, right now this is based on two different projects. The dollar seismic systems and elevator finishes. This is uh, anticipating a full uh, upgrade of the dollar clubhouse to bring it into uh, current code as far as accessibility by adding a uh, elevator but also taking care of uh, major HVAC systems and seismic upgrades that were all identified in previous studies. The hillside uh, pool building and accessibility into the pool projects uh, is listed in the near term. Long term, the golf course uh, crossings, that actually is included in the uh, line item that's called Rossmore Capital Budget. 
And then you have the, the various items in the wish list, which uh, currently are not included in the funding model. What the funding model ultimately does include is three components really uh, uh, for expenditures. One would be the, the long range uh, or the facilities master plan. The other one is the Rossmore capital budget, which we also refer to as the long range capital budget. And uh, I'm gonna ask Joel to share that here just so you get a, a picture of that. Okay, let me go ahead and share my screen. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the summarized version of the long range capital uh, uh, plan. It uh, goes out several years to, uh, to about, I believe 2048. Um, these are the major categories associated with uh, each of the locations. I'll go ahead and expand it. And it goes into very detailed line item detail associated with each of the locations and it projects what the capital expenditure is going to be for each of the respective years. So we could see 2022. So this is you know, very detailed, rather long. We have several hundred line items. Uh, we could see that the, um, the capital budget for 2022 is this 4.5 million. It includes some of the items um, on the uh, facility master plan. In 2023, again, this is just a projection. This will be firmed up during the budgeting process for 2023, but we could see we've got 2.9 million for 2023, 1.6 for 2024, et cetera, et cetera. One of the items that you'll see there that is, is on that list is the emergency access improvements. Uh, at 500,000, that's one of the items that the, the board wanted to uh, reevaluate uh, in 2023. So many of the items that were previously discussed in the, the uh, facilities master plan actually materialize and, or show up in the long range capital budget. Uh, so you can go ahead and take that down, Joel. Um, things like uh, replacement of the golf course bridges will show up in that annual uh, list of projects. So the, the planning committee and the board will annually uh, evaluate that long-term plan and the list of projects in the um, upcoming year as well as the equipment and replacement uh, budget, which is also reflected in the spreadsheet and the various components of the facilities master plan and coming up with the total trust estate budget. The funding model that uh, ELS and their team had prepared and that Joel has uh, worked on as well, has uh, the ability to uh, modify various components such as the membership transfer fee, um, the number of uh, estimated transfers, the uh, potential lending and uh, interest rate projections and so forth. So the model can be adjusted and we'll bring that back, uh, it sounds like to the next finance committee meeting so they can further evaluate that when considering the membership transfer fee uh, adjustments and recommendations. So at this point, I, I think your uh, action is to consider the list of priorities as presented here from the planning committee uh, we will be bringing back to the planning committee a draft overall documents that will outline the uh, various uh, components that ELS went through in completing their study, and it will include the funding model based on your actions here today and any actions of the uh, planning and finance committee, and then we'll do a final update uh, for adoption once all of that has been complete. Okay, uh, questions, uh, Leanne. 
First, I want to commend Jeff and Joel for putting together the funding model based on uh, what they realized was not feasible. Uh, we started with an enormous list and they have worked it out so that a lot of the projects that were on that list have been modified so they can be done in a modified form. And I really appreciate that. And um, I think it's a very a good tool and, and their, their ideas were good. Um, I just want to confirm that um, inflation is built into the model. Is that correct? Julie, you want to answer? Yes, there is an inflation factor built into the model. Um, I believe when ELS originally put it together, the inflation assumptions were not what we're experiencing now. So I do believe that needs to be modified. Okay. The, the individual projects as well had significant uh, escalation estimates built in, uh, in addition. Other comments? So I'll make a couple of comments. I'm, I'm, I'm troubled on a couple of fronts. And, and one is the 20% increase in the MTFP. I'm just concerned about that um, as a shocking increase. Um, secondly, taking on $29 million worth of debt uh, to accomplish this 10-year plan doesn't seem realistic in my viewpoint. We're at $12 million worth of debt right now and, and don't have a lot of extra money to spend. So um, in a way, I, I think the finance committee needs to take a more holistic approach, look at this, you know, taking a look at taking on $20, $29 million worth of debt, et cetera. Uh, you know, one of the things that strikes me, I, I perfectly understand and encourage us to get the MOD offices into, <laughs> into some sort of uh, great accommodation soon. Uh, but that's not going to happen uh, quite as soon as we'd like it to. But I wonder why we want to spend $12 million on the warehouse and garage uh, before we do the offices, when the offices are so much more important. And if we move the warehouse garage, $12 million, wherever the number is, to beyond the 10 years, suddenly we're looking at things that are affordable and perhaps a realistic look at um, additional debt that is required to accomplish this. So uh, I guess one of the things I'd like us to think about is moving that garage warehouse uh, beyond 10 years. So what, one of the things I would suggest you, you do is it, within the scope of the whole MOD complex, really evaluate what the various needs are <clears throat> for that and what are the most economic and efficient ways to accomplish those goals. The, the reason why the, the garage and warehouse was moved first is so that you can reorient the uh, office building and create a, a better parking and circulation environment there. Right now with both the warehouse there and the office, you can have deliveries uh, come and your forklift operators moving around all while you have uh, residents trying to park and access the buildings. So you have two uh, functions that don't really belong together happening at that same location. That was the thinking of, of moving that facility first so it's out of the way. There are numerous, numerous ways to approach this and the, the facilities master plan didn't you know, go into that level of study and, and detail. Uh, I mean, you can leave the existing facility where it is and create a new entry from the, the upper lot, uh, you know, where the RV parking and canopy are. It, there's just a, a number of ways you can look at this as you get closer uh, to evaluating it. Well, and I understand that, Jeff, but I thought ELS presented an option to redo the offices without doing the garage to warehouse so we don't have to spend $12 million. So we don't have to take on additional debt and we might not have to raise the MTF so drastically. So, so I get, you know, we can wait five years to make that decision, but we're making decisions today uh, based on what we're projecting here. So, I mean, is it viable to do the office building first and move 
garage warehouse to beyond the 10 years? Can we, is that something we can do now? Yeah, that is certainly viable. And, and I think what I'm suggesting is you might find that you don't even need to do the garage warehouse if you do a different orientation as ELS gives a, an option for. Um, it may cost a little bit more to do the MOD office building in that configuration, um, but you would save then ultimately on redoing the garage and warehouse. Well, it seems to me that we should be doing that. Am I, am I off center? I need some feedback from the board here. We could save $10 million. Wouldn't that be worth taking a look at? Kathleen, Ted? Uh, yeah, I agree with you. Um, uh, hold okay. Anybody else? <laughs> Ted? Uh, so, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I agree with you. But oh, wait a minute, I, I got myself off mute. So, um, oh, okay, go, go. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I agree with you. I think um, looking at other options to save money and uh, on on that and putting some other things on the wish list, like the ramp into the hillside pool um, is, I think should be on the wish list and a redo of the building of the um, bathhouse um, it's, I was in there, it's perfectly functional, so that can go on the wish list. So wh what I'm thinking today is all we're going to say is that this document um, is something we will continue, this tool rather, is something that we would continue to use. And then we will have further discussions every month if we need to about different things on it and, and should they be moved um, onto the wish list, like you want the water reclamation moved onto the wish list. We don't have to make those decisions um, today. It's just that we would continue using this tool um, to readjust as, as we go on. I, I agree with you that the um, raising the MTF drastically is, is uh, pretty difficult to uh, swallow. Uh, Ted and then Leanne. So you were talking about the uh, maintenance a piece of MOD is it seems to me that Jeff in at some point you said we were you know we've moved to using electric blowers on everything but you said that the the charging system for that is maxed out and isn't that located in that maintenance building area uh, that is in the upper warehouse area uh, the contractor lot area I mean, they, there's a, a project up at MOD would involve, you know, electrical capacity evaluation, uh, the, certainly the sewer system that uh, is running down the, the hill and the capacity for that and the routing. There's a number of projects that come into play. And one, just uh, to your point, Dwight, about the MTF, and you think 20% is a big raise, uh, it's, we got a lot of big projects to look at, and pretty soon we're going to have no equity to loan against. We're just going to be loaning, uh, getting loans against uh, our good word that, yeah, we're going to pay you back. We're not, we, and we don't know what kind of interest they'll put on that to protect themselves. So I really think that we should think about uh, and, and if the MTF stayed in line, I gave you that example of my, buying my place. If it stayed in line, it should really be 15000 now if it stays in line from when I first moved in. because my And, and even maybe more because I'm way more than three times. Uh, my place is worth more than three times that I paid for it. So I really think that we have, uh, and, and maybe Tim can help me with this piece of it, they went a long time without doing anything with the MTF before they, and they got in a hole because they didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. And then they raised it to, I'm not sure the numbers, but I think it went to seven and then nine and then 10 or something like that. Uh, if that's correct, Tim, uh, you can answer that piece of it. But Yeah, that, that I can't say that they found themselves in a hole. I know that, the first major renovation project in Rossmore was the gateway complex. So when they built the, the two clubhouses that, you know, that I'm in and the one in front, um, that was the first time that GRF had really ever spent much of the accumulated trust fund monies is what I've been told. Um, so since then, 
that would that and that occurred about 20 a little over 20 years ago so uh, it's really been in the last 20 years that that the mtf became an important element to funding these updates and upgrades and these new buildings like the event center and like the fitness center and and it and it, obviously it's it's a critical essential component of our ability to prevent having to add that all to the coupon that's the only other alternative we don't have the me- a mechanism in our governing documents to do a special assessment and, and one more thing that i have to say if if twelve thousand dollars will keep you from moving in here then maybe you should be looking at someplace else to to live maybe that if that's going to take you over the edge that you can't live comfortably here then maybe this is not the spot for you to look at. So that's why I still don't think $12,000 is too much because that's only done when you become a member one time, the first time you buy into Rossmore. You want to buy multi-houses after you're in here, it doesn't matter. But it's only that one time to become a member. And if that is going to be, if that's what the real estate people and everybody's really worried about, it's a one-time buy. And if you're that close to getting into here, you might have problems later on because the coupons are not going to go down either. And if that's going to take you over the edge, you might not be able to take care of your coupons later on. So I really think financially it is a no brainer. This is not that much money to get in here. We're talking about prioritization of projects and uh, Dale, we're getting close to lunch. So don't forget, we're going to get lunch soon. Uh, Leanne and then Mary. Yeah, two points um, to Kathleen's statement. Um, we're not. We're here to approve the prioritization of this funding model. So if if we go with Dwight's suggestion of putting the eleven thousand eleven million <clears throat> for water reclamation into the funding model, we can't approve anything today because it has to go back to uh, finance committee and get reevaluated and placed into the uh, projection. Um, my By second the way, point- Leanne, Leanne, just a correction on my part, the 11 million, I think we would move to the wish list is what uh, Jeff Oh, was I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, wish list. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, well, that's yeah. not figured into the funding model. Got it. <laughs> right, um, right, right. So that, but, our point moving- today is to prioritize what we're seeing here on the funding model. So that's our point right. today. Right. Um, right. But also I want to, just say that the ELS process was valuable and I'm glad that we did it. But what we did was we opened up a Pandora's box to the residents Mm -hmm. who were very excited about asking for all kinds of things. But I think in order to avoid debt um, going forward in the next 10 to 15 years um, or excessive debt, I'll say, I think we have to learn how to say no. And so we may have to get a little tougher uh, because we already have uh, looks like um, like a million eight for long-term capital expenditures next year. So um, we just have to get a little tougher, I think. Okay, Mary and Kathleen and Carl. I don't understand this. Uh, I'm going to uh, first from a different point of view, but I, I know where Ted is coming from. And I think of raising the, uh, the fee to 12,000 is hardly, it's it's not excessive at all because as Ted said, you pay once when you move here and you use the benefits of that $12,000 over every year that you live here, as opposed to having to raise coupons or source money. It's, it's kind of like pay now and use over your tenure here in Rossmore. And again, that money makes Rossmore continue to be the wonderful place we live. And without the investment in the future, to me, we're really jeopardizing people's ability to continue enjoying this community. So Mary, I appreciate your comment, but if we could keep comments limited to prioritization of projects on this list, we're not talking about MTF right now. Okay, Kathleen and Carl. Okay, so um, I think we can approve uh, this prioritization today um, without any problem, knowing that we can change it next month if we want. We can change it at any time. So this isn't locking us into what we're going to do over the next 10 years. This is just saying this is the current one and it can be changed at any future time. Am I not right about that, 
do I need to be corrected? Well, could I just uh, rebut that for a second? So what we're doing here is setting forth a plan, if we would approve this, that theoretically, hypothetically, we're going to take on $29 million worth of debt over the next 10 years and raise the MTF to roughly, what, 17 grand by the end of that time period. So yes, we can change this at any point in time, but we're making decisions today. Uh, for example, I'll say it again, I think the garage warehouse should be moved beyond the initial 10 years so that we're not thinking about taking on $29 million worth of debt. And we can take a, another look at the, at the MTF, get the things on the list that we know that we want to do. This is a this is a plan. This is a this is a roadmap for the future uh, for board members and for the finance committee. Uh, so, uh, really so an important step. So, but, Dwight, you think this needs to go back to the finance committee or back to the planning committee? I, quite honestly, I think it should go back to both. Uh, I agree with you. I do too. I totally agree. One more. <laughs> yeah, all right, so there's a motion on the floor. Paul, what is your motion? Uh, my motion is to refer this entire, um, the master facilities proposed master facilities plan uh, back to finance and back to the plan commission, planning committee for further review before it comes back to the board. Is there a second to that motion? I second. Carl seconded that motion. Any further? Uh, Tim. So I, I would recommend that you are specific about what you want the two committees to evaluate. I, I think it's to be fair to them. They've already gone through the exercise um, with quite a bit of time. So if there are certain components specifically that you want to have evaluated or concepts, whether it's a component or a concept or whatever, I think that to be fair to them, you should be clear as to what it is that you are sent, why you're sending it back to them so they know what to look at. Uh, Carl and then Leanne. Yeah, I think we have a big unknown at this point, and that's the medical center. The medical center serves as collateral for our loans, and we have no idea what we may be demanded to pay down on loans to get us back in good financial shape. And I don't see that until we move further along in the sale process that we're going to be able to answer those questions and know how much we can really afford to spend. Okay, Leanne? Can we debate the issue of the garage slash, I mean, the building slash warehouse right now so that we can make a decision to send it back to the finance committee and have them work on the model with that in mind? I'm going to look to Jeff as to how viable it is to move that at this point. So uh, <clears throat> we, we could certainly look at if, if the interest is focusing on that specific project uh, or, or any others, we can get further feedback uh, and, and loop in the cost estimator uh, to give us a little bit better uh, understanding of, you know, what an alternative for the office building would be uh, in keeping the garage there or moving it out to a beyond tenure. I think we can get a little more clarity on that. Okay, so uh, Tim, are you suggesting that the tasks for the uh, planning committee should be outlined in this motion or can we make a list separately? I, I, I well, I think it should be outlined in the motion that you're, the, the motion is to send it back to planning and finance, but to do what? Right. They might just turn right back around and send it back to you and say, well, we've looked at it. We, this is what we <laughs> recommended. Right. So give them, give them a specific charge of what you want them to do. Okay. So Paul, would you agree to an amendment to add the warehouse garage uh, component for further evaluation to that motion? Well, I think um, that there was a 71 page report that was um, going to be presented to the planning committee that the planning committee needs to look at. 
and needs to react to and needs to consider. I think that would be the first step. I don't think this should go back to finance at this time until a recommendation from pl the plan, plan committee is ready to ask the finance committee what it needs after it studies the report. I mean, we have. So do you, so do you want to one, amend your motion? We only have one piece right now. We have a spreadsheet with a proposed outline of, you know, possible costs and possible slots to put those costs into, based on the projects that we have. We don't have a we don't have a comprehensive view yet of this whole master plan. So. So do you. Do you want to amend your motion, Paul? Um, well, my motion was to send it to stop consideration here so that the planning committee and the finance committee would have, uh, yes, I would, um, send it back to the planning committee so the planning committee can make further deliberations or considerations on the proposed master facilities plan, and then come up with uh, recommendations to both the board and the finance committee based on further deliberation. So Carl, do you agree to that amendment? Yes, I do. Okay. Deborah, were you able to capture that? I believe I have. Okay. Uh, Kathleen and Leanne. Uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I would agree that uh, it first needs to go to the planning committee. Um, and I don't know if this is clear in the motion, but to make just say uh, other projects that could be reduced, just, you know, generically other projects that could be reduced, could reduce the, um, the cost of the planning uh, or of the prioritization plan. Uh, you know, so that we can not only just look at the at the mod, um, at the MOD change, but also look at some uh, some of the other ones like the pool renovation uh, for the. For you, you're freezing. What else? Whatever else. Okay. Okay. Are you proposing an amendment? Be found. Is Kathleen freezing, or is it? Yeah. So th so that I would make it. There. Kathleen, I think you're back. Uh, I'm good. Or, oh, I'm, I'm, yeah. So yeah, my internet, I got a little sign. My internet uh, connection was unstable. So um, yeah, so I, I would uh, make an amendment to make it clear that they would look at, the planning committee would look at um, any money saving proposal uh, in the, uh, in the plan. Okay. Um. Um, Paul, are you okay with that amendment? Certainly. Okay, Carl? Part of overall consideration. Okay. Carl, are you okay with that? Yes. Okay. Uh, Leanne and then Neva. Okay. I, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but this model is the premise of the, faci the entire facilities master plan. So, we have to decide on the model and the prioritization before the creation of the actual plan. So we don't want to look, we don't want to send it back to planning to look at the plan until we've decided on the model. Is that correct? Well, that's what I asked of, you know, 10 minutes ago. Are, are we just uh, approving the, the model, the tool that we're going to use? Correct. And, and, right. And, and everybody said, no, we have to have the specific plan. So I'm, I'm confused. <laughs> the, the, <clears throat> the model is not something really that's going to change uh, <clears throat> in, in, in its functionality. It gives the planning committee and the board and the finance committee the tool to uh, do a variety of scenarios and see what the outcome will, will be. So it, it, it is a, a tool in the planning process. The, 
master plan will be made up of the list of projects and the prioritization that will be then put into that model. So your the critical work right right now is to evaluate where your priorities are, and then <clears throat> then we need to see how that fits into the the model and what adjustments need to be made. So if the goal is to not increase the membership transfer fee to the twelve thousand, or the goal is not to take on additional debt. Uh, in the out years, then we would need to make adjustments to the list of projects. If the goal or the committee is okay with increasing the membership transfer fee as proposed, then that changes what level of projects you're able to commit to. Uh, so it you can go both ways with it. Neva. Well, I, if Dwight and other people feel that the $2,000 increase in the membership transfer fee is too much, then shouldn't we give the planning committee and the finance committee a target saying we only want to increase it to 1000 For example, we only want to increase it to $1,000, not $2,000. And we don't want, uh, maybe we don't want we wanted to increase three hundred dollars each year uh not five hundred i mean do we need to give them a target like that i think what, what neva is is suggesting is is really how we arrived at the current set of recommendations and, and that is the the finance committee reviewed the projects in the list and the the total amount required and they came up with the twelve thousand five hundred Therefore, we knew in order to maintain our, our ratios for debt to uh, revenue and so forth, we needed to cut out a set amount of, of money and projects. So we made a recommendation of adjustments, which is what I, I just reviewed and you see before you. In order to make further adjustments to that, I think that the planning committee, as Tim suggested, needs some of those parameters of we'd like to eliminate, you know, borrowing or or keep it to uh, a certain parameters or we'd like to look at a scenario where there is uh, a uh, less increase on the, the membership transfer fee so they know what level of adjustments needs needs to be made so what you're saying it comes back to this list of projects really that the planning that the board and the planning committee are looking at well, it, I think it comes back to where is your comfort level on the membership transfer fee? Is it is it twelve thousand? Is it ten thousand? Maintaining is it is something higher than that? W what is your level of comfort for considering additional debt financing in in the out years? If if the comfort level is maintaining ten thousand, we can run the model and know how much we'll have to work with and thus make adjustments in the, the planning committee can then make adjustments in the level of projects and the scope of those projects. It's sort of the chicken or the egg. It, it really <laughs> it is. To, yeah. <laughs> uh, Carl and then Dale. Yes, I'm sort of thinking this whole thing is we have a set of, of priorities but we don't know at what level we can cut out until we uh, understand the finance. And since we put the MTF back to finance and legal, I don't know that we can really make much of a decision. And I agree uh, today, and I agree with Jeff, the model is the model. And I don't think we're talking about changing the model. I think we, we might be talking about changing priorities, but until we know what the financial side of it is, I don't think we can, we can determine what a reasonable cutoff is gonna be. Okay, Dale? I think there are three logical steps. The first step that needs to be finalized is what are we going to set the MTF at? Then the second step is to send this whole thing to the planning committee. Once they do their work, 
then it goes to the finance committee. Okay. Um, other comments? Are there things that are not on this list that we think should be on the list? For example, I know I've brought this up before. I I'm very interested in taking a fresh look at the golf course and making sure that we're de it's properly designed for water conservation while preserving the golf course. I don't see that in the plan. I think that should be considered. Over half of our water that we use in GRF is uh, non-golf course water. Where, where is the water conservation planning in our master plan? Well, Comments? I'll, I'll speak to that. I mean, uh, do you have a proposal? I mean, what is involved in that? Does that mean hiring a consultant? What does that mean? Well, when I think of a master plan, we're looking into the future, right? If we have no, to spend I, money I, to preserve our amenities, like the golf course and our landscaping, shouldn't we be thinking about that as a part of our master plan? I understand that you're at that, but your idea, what does it encompass? Does it, are you proposing we hire a consultant? So if so, what is that expense and how do we add that into the funding model? That's, that's why we have staff. I don't, so, I, I, so, I, I have no of, idea. <laughs> some of what you're, you're referring to, uh, we would include certainly in, there could be two components to that. Um, one is as part of the uh, water reclamation project, you may do some uh, water conservation improvements, but also within the long-term capital project list, uh, there's things like the median conversion. There's uh, been projects such as, I think we've converted close to 15 acres of irrigated land uh, on the golf course already. And we're looking at potential for another uh, five to 10 acres. And, and some of that capital cost would be included in the long-term uh, capital funding. It wouldn't be listed as a, a major uh, facilities master plan project, but it would still come out of the, the capital and that, that line item right now in the spreadsheet is called Rossmore Capital Budgets that, that Joel shared with you. Okay. Is there anything else that we should be thinking about? Okay. All right. So I believe there's a motion on the floor. Is there? <laughs> there is. There is, it, there is a motion on the floor, isn't there, Deborah? Do you remember yes, what it is? is? I don't. Yeah, um, I, I don't have the full accounting, but I can read uh, just of it. Um, OK, so Paul made the motion and Carl seconded um, to send this item back to the planning committee so that the planning committee can make uh, for, for the proposed um, changes to the facilities master plan, then come to the board with deliberations. There was also an amendment um, that the. Sorry, looking, looking. And to make it clear that the planning committee would look at any money saving proposals, I'll agree to that amendment. So that was seconded. There is now a motion on the floor to um, uh, that motion as amended. So let, let me clarify Paul's original motion was for the planning and the finance committee to take it back for further review. The amendment was just for the planning committee, but it didn't exclude the finance committee in Paul's amendment. So just to clarify what Deborah just read. So Paul's original motion was to move, he moved to send this back to planning and finance for further review. That was seconded. Um, then Kathleen amended it to say that the planning committee would look for any money saving proposal in the plan. Both Paul and Carl agreed to that amendment. So that's the motion on the no, floor. No, 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 no. Um, I, I see where the confusion starts. So there was an original, I just want to clarify, I'm getting this on record, that Paul and Carl uh, made a motion to refer this back to the finance committee and to the planning committee for further review before going to the board. Both agreed to wipe that motion out and make a new one. Paul made a motion to send this back to the uh, 
planning committee so that the planning committee can make a pro further proposed changes to the facilities master plan and then come up with some sort of recommendation um, then. So Carl agreed to that, that was seconded. Then Kathleen made an additional amendment to make it clear that the planning committee would look into a money saving proposal. So the original motion was to the planning committee only. Now at this point with the amendment that they would also look at money saving proposals. So I think we'll have to go back and look at that video just because I, I typed it verbatim as he, as he said it. So uh, if you type something different verbatim, then we have a, a difference of opinion. So we can either restate the motion. Maybe that's the better way to do it. Yes, Good I would sir. love that. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> All right. So, Paul, do you want to restate the motion? Yes. First, I want to um, um, remove the, orig the original and any amended emotions. Let's clean the slate. <laughs> Do yes. I get an agreement from Kathleen and um, it would be Carl, Carl and Carl. Yeah, I, I agree. agree. OK, yeah, OK, OK. And I'm not sure where to go on this motion. Uh, let, could I jump in and say something? Yes, Jeff, Jeff talked about what is the goal, right? And so in, in, after he said that, I was thinking about it could actually, uh, we could have a goal of, let's just say the transfer fee being only raised to um, 11,000 and then every three years instead of every two years, raise it another thousand. And that being the goal, then, then we would go and look at the plan or the finance and see how that could be accomplished. That would be uh, you know, as I think Jeff's idea of a goal. Is, 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 Jeff, you want to comment? Yeah, I, I think that would, if there was some parameters such as that provided to planning, they would then know what, what they're trying to look at to accomplish it, as far as moving projects from, you know, near term to long term, modifying projects and so forth. Okay, so that would be my motion then. Is there a second to that motion? I'm not I'll second. I'll and second. What, and what was that motion? The motion was um, to recommend that we look at a $11,000 increase or increase the transfer fee to $11,000 with a three year increase um, of 1,000 more every three years. Okay. okay. And Mary, you're in agreement with that? Okay. Um, I will agree with that. Okay. Did you have further comments, Mary? Yes, I did, please. Okay. I'm thinking that what we want to do, can you hear me? I, it, yes, is, we can. If you tell, we, we were asking the planning commission to look at a revised amount of capital funding and use that revised amount to come back with their recommendations for what we can do and when. I would say that's that's our goal is, OK, you've got less money now. How would you reprioritize what's on the list? Oh, oh, OK, but this motion is only dealing with the with the MTF at this point in time. Neva, um, or I'm sorry, Deborah, let's go to you first. I just really quickly, it just says uh, recommend look into increasing. I just need clarification. Are you asking for the planning committee or just the chair of board is going to look into this? Or is this going to the finance committee? No, I think that it could go to the planning committee and the finance committee um, to to both look at, um, you know, what would be the financial ramifications of that? Like how much money? And then the planning committee to say, well, what, how can we shift things around so that that works? So would it go I agree. Yeah. So could I just make a comment that, so we have this model that we can do five different scenarios. We can do 10 different scenarios. Uh, and I'm, I'm, by this motion, we're only looking at one scenario. And so are we really limiting our options uh, would be my question. Uh, Neva, Ted, and then Carl. Well, cool. I think if we are giving the the finance committee and the planning committee a target, 
we also it also should include our target on indebtedness. If people think 29 million is more debt than we want to occur, then we need that's part of this model. And so we need to give them the target uh, of what do we want to say we only want to take on $10 million in debt. Uh, but you need to give them a target on that too. Do you have a proposal on that, Neva? Uh, just grasping out of the sky, um, let's say 10 million. You want to make, are you proposing an amendment to that motion? I'm proposing an amendment that, excuse me, just a minute. Sorry, my cleaning person is here. Oh, <laughs> that's important. So yeah. you're proposing an amendment to uh, to look at ten taking on ten million dollars for the debt rather than twenty nine million. Yeah. Okay, Just, uh, Kathleen, are you okay with that? Um, you know, I think that could be a separate motion. Um, and it, it might be just simpler to leave that, uh, you know, as uh, the, the, as a separate motion that they would also look at a ten million dollar debt. I, I think it's a, like a separate issue from the MTF um, money involved. Okay. Um, I don't. I don't think so, um, because this whole. When I listen to the finance committee discussion about this, it's both an. In, <coughs> It's both an increase in the debt and an increase in the MTF. They both work to, together to make this plan possible. So I don't see the sense of making it a separate motion. All right. But I would say that um, something that else is going to come into this is the, when the uh, medical center is, is um is sold. And um, so I think that has more to do with the amount of debt that we would take on is like the money from that. What are we going to do with that? So um, oh, hold uh, on. So it, hold on. So so Neva has proposed an amendment. Is there a second to Neva's proposed you. amendment? You, somebody can't understand. I'll second. Me? Oh, Mary is seconding Neva's proposed amendment. Right. Uh, we need to have a vote on that then. Uh, so all those in favor, raise your hand. I only see three, four. Okay, so there. Yep. And then opposed. It. Oh, opposed is one, two, three, four, five. So it fails. Okay. You all right, Deborah? Uh, if I can get a record of that in uh, names and who voted yes and who voted no. I need well, that in a uh, written form. Well, let's do a roll call then. Be okay. Easy. One moment. 9B2. All right. So um, this is in favor of the, okay, Walker. So th this is just to be clear. So we're talking about Neva's proposal to amend. Uh, yes. It would be an insertion of that as a whole. So as the motion is amended, correct. So you're saying yes, and so yes. Uh, I, I think I'm going to say no. Okay, Hamaji. No. Hurt. Yes. Was that a yes? I'm sorry, it was a little fuzzy. Yes. Yes. Okay, yes. thank you, Bentley. No. Brown. No. Clarity. Yes. Harrington. No. Madaraki. No. Fails. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor from Kathleen about the $11,000 MTF. Uh, Ted and Carl. Okay, so when we, I'm kind of like a little lost right here. So I just want to make sure I can get back into what we're talking about. This is to consider the plan, the planning committee's recommendation for the prioritization of the projects in the facility master plan, right? That's what we started out with. That's what we started out with, yes. Okay, so all we're doing really, we shouldn't, I don't know how the MTF got involved in this other than how it affects the plan, but shouldn't we just be saying 
Uh, Jeff showed us here what was included or excluded from it. And we're pretty much saying, yes, that's good. And the question we would have is where we're going to move the, the, the excluded and put them in because now it, the planning, planning committee has already done this. Now it's for the board to decide a, an example, water reclamation plant, it's been excluded. Where do we want to put that on the list? Isn't that all we're supposed to be doing here right now? We're not supposed to be getting into all this other stuff. Ted, that's a good point. But we've got we've got a motion on the floor about this eleven thousand dollar proposal. So we need to limit discussion to that right now. I think we're ready for a vote on that. Are we ready for a vote? Yes. Roll call vote on that. Lane Walker. No. Sunco. Yes. Machi. No. Heard. No. Bentley. No. Brown. No. Clarity? No. Harrington? No. Mataraki? No. Fails. Okay, so, uh, Carl. Yeah, I, I think we already made uh, a motion about the MTF, and I think, you know. No motion. Are we There's really, no motion. you know, earlier on? No, there's been no motion on MTF at this point. Actually, we uh, took a straw vote earlier in the meeting during the finance committee report. All right, it was a straw vote. Right. So, all right, so let's take a step back here for a second. I think what, what <laughs> we're talking about is the finance committee and planning committee need to work together on this, develop a, uh, several scenarios that the board can look at. I think there's some some things that need to be looked at in terms of debt capacity that we're interested in taking on. Uh, I think also this elasticity in, in the MTF and what that means, and also in terms of what projects are, are included or excluded from this list. So I think it needs to go back to both committees for reconsideration uh, and present several scenarios to the board rather than just uh, trying to deal with this piecemeal. Uh, it, it, because I'll go back to something Neva said earlier. We, we need to roll this out to the community in a very concerted, concise way that everybody understands what's being considered for the long term for Rossmore. This, this is a very, very important document that we're talking about here, and not just for us today, but for future boards. And so we, we need to be thinking much beyond, uh, you know, getting to lunch here, uh, which I want to do very quickly. Um, uh, Carl. Yes, I'm, I'm thinking that you're right. We need community involvement. And one of the things is once these scenarios are come up, why don't we have a town hall? Because I think these are going to need in-depth explanations, et cetera, and feedback for, and better feedback from the community. And I think a town hall format might be good for that and might be very good for public relations. It's a good communication device. Uh, Dale, I'm sorry, Aniva, did you have a question? You're on mute. I think that we ought to ask the planning committee and the finance committee to work together, as you said, and develop a couple of scenarios which would be based on different plans for the MTF and our limit on debt, the debt we're willing to take on. And then it's time to have a town hall. Okay. Uh, Dale and then Mary. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that based on our experience here, that what we need to do ultimately is sort of narrow it, the focus down, and then put it out to the, the public for their um, feedback. Otherwise, we're going to get what, 50 or 100 different viewpoints all crisscrossing, and it isn't going to help us or the community at all. Okay. Uh, Mary? 
I can tell you some good news. Joel Lesser has put together a wonderful worksheet where you can change the scenario depending on what you spend, how much you spend, and when you spend it, and what is required in terms of the MTF and the debt level. So he has already done so much of that to put together multiple scenarios looking at it. So we're, we're on a good start there. So with all of this said, do we need a motion to send this back to planning and uh, finance to develop more scenarios? I, we need a motion. Okay. Who will make a motion to that? Ted? I don't want to make a motion. <laughs> I don't know that it needs to be. I don't. So <clears throat> I keep looking at this. It's, it's there. It's up to the board now to look at it and say, no, we're not going to do this project this year and we can move it to where we want to on this sheet, isn't it? Or it, should we set... If we send it to planning, planning will take a look at it, redo it, we'll come back here, and we're going to have the same conversation. Isn't it us? It's done now. Shouldn't the board is here? We look at it like, like the water treatment plant. It's excluded. Move it down into the wish list area, and it can be moved up by any one of us later on or a different board when it comes time to do it. But for right now, we got that. We got the, the top, the covering over Peacock. Okay, that's off the list. Move it down to the wish list. And we just, now we clean up the list. We figure out what we got to deal with. And then we deal with that. Because I don't see what you're going to benefit by sending it back to the planning committee to, to make up a new list for us to debate again. Amen. Uh <laughs> okay, let's keep talking. Paul, Mary, and Kathleen. Well, I I. I think that you proposed, Dwight, that the water reclamation project be moved down. I don't think we decided on that. The last time, the last time that we voted on that, we voted to keep it in and to do the environmental report, which is underway. But we did not move that anywhere other than keeping it as a high priority for the reasons that Tim has stated at least a dozen times. Okay, Since so, so we are, Paul, let me just stop you there, because we are getting in the weeds so much on this deal that we have to get this back to committee level. We're, we're wasting time here. Thank you. And so, uh, all right, I'm going to make a motion that, that this uh, facilities master plan be referred back to the planning committee and finance committee, and board members will submit a list of um, uh, suggestions or comments in regards to both the finance side and or the planning side to those committee chairs within the next two weeks. Can I get a second? Um, well, let me add, let me, thank, before thank you get a second. Carl. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, so let me just say that they will come up with several scenarios okay. to present yeah, to agree. the board. Okay. Agreed. Yes. Thank you. So uh, it, resulting in multiple scenarios to be presented to the board. Carl, are you okay with that? Uh, that's great. Okay. Are we talking about a joint meeting? Because to go to two different committees, you're going to get, you know, a half dozen um, perspectives probably from both committees, which may or may not mesh. I think together we would let's hear, the, let's finance let the would hear what, what planning committee is thinking and planning committee could hear what finance committee is thinking and get a joint recommendation from that working group. I think that's probably a good idea, but I don't think I it agree. needs to be a part of the motion. Uh, Leanne. Okay. I have a revised idea or motion that there are nine opinions here with the GRF, there are four on the planning committee. We came into this item on the agenda somewhat confused about what our goal was on this agenda. So I think nine of us need to go home, give this a lot of thought, and keep it on the agenda for the April meeting so that we together with all nine opinions present can present our ideas and which scenarios we would like the finance committee to look at. That saves probably a month of time. And 
it just doesn't make any sense for me to me to go back to planning, have four people of a body of nine come up with their own scenarios and then have the board then say, no, we don't like those scenarios. We have our other scenarios. I just I think are you it needs proposing an amendment the board. Are you are you proposing an amendment? <laughs> well, I, I mean, am, we, we I have am, to move okay. forward here. We I can, am. We can throw out ideas all day, but we need to take some votes and get this meeting over with. And I, I will I will say that Dwight said that the members of the board would send in their comments, which would be their suggestions on what should be moved and, and, and all that. So, uh, so I think what you want is. I understand that, but that sending in recommendations will still limit discussion on those recommendations. You, okay. the board, you, will not be. Are you proposing an amendment? I am. I'm proposing that this discussion get continued or added to the April agenda, so that we can discuss the scenarios that we we can create scenarios from that meeting. Is there a second to that motion? May I ask a question before that? Are no, you talking about no. having? Okay. <laughs> no. Is there a second to that motion? Ted, are you seconding? Ted is seconding to that motion. So a uh, roll, uh, well, question, Mary, on that issue. Are we still wanting the planning commission working with the finance commission to create scenarios? We are, we are now talking about the amendment that Leanne proposed. Leanne, what is that motion? The to motion is, this is to, next to month. defer this to April to create okay. scenarios for the Finance Committee. All right, Carl. Yes, I think this brings up a point, especially if we're going to start meeting in person. I think we need to revive the mid-month meetings and because our agendas okay. are getting too long. And if we're going to get into extended discussions, like I think this is going to be, it's going to be too much for our regular meetings. Okay. All right. So there's a motion on, <laughs> there's a motion on the floor. Uh, roll call, Deborah. Could we restate the motion, please? So the original motion, uh, speaker, pardon me. My system just shifted one moment. Uh, that the this is made by Dwight and Carl that the facilities master plan is referred back to the planning committee and finance committee. Um, but Deborah, we're not they, voting on that. We're not voting on that motion. We're voting on the amendment by Leanne. Right, and that the amendment was that um, Leanne is inserting because that's the only way that you can make an amendment uh, is you can only insert, remove, or add language. So she's also stating that she would like to make an amendment to that motion by saying that she would like to keep it, uh, defer it to the April agenda. April GRF agenda. Mm -hmm. So that motion doesn't make any sense to me. Correct. Uh, Leanne, would you be willing to rescind that and we'll vote it on it in a separate motion? Sure. Okay, Ted, are you okay with that? Okay, so we're back to the original motion. Okay, so the original motion, Walker? Yes. Jumpo? Kat Kathleen? Yes. <laughs> Hamaji? No. Kurt? Yes. Bentley? No. Brown? Yes. Larity? Yes. Carrington? No. Madaraki? No. Okay, so Leanne, now you want to make an, uh, another motion? Wait, did the motion carry? It did carry. Yes. So there's no point in your motion. Okay, if the motion carried. Yes, there was four no's. So the motion carries with five yeses. Right. Oh. Yes. And then I so you, you can't um, But I'm just I'm just thinking it makes it may make no sense to make another motion. Terrific. Then we can move forward. Is that right? 
<laughs> Paul, Paul. I'm sorry, I'm unmuting now. <laughs> Can we move forward? Okay, I think we have. Uh, so now, the last item on our uh, agenda is civility. Doesn't that make sense at this point in time? So the, when it's when yeah. it's lunchtime, it's it's well past lunchtime. So, all right. I, I have to ask the board at this point in time, is this, is this an item that we could move to next month's meeting, take lunch and adjourn and recess for executive session? Is that, okay. let me see a show of hands if that's acceptable. There's a lot of hungry people. Okay, Leanne, appreciate all your efforts in putting that together, but uh, we'll, we'll hold that for the next time. So we are going to, it is 144. Uh, some people need a longer lunch, and I understand that, but I think we need to limit this to a half an hour today. So 215, Neva, you're going to have to deal with it. <laughs> 215, uh, we will read. I can't chew that fast. Never. <laughs> you can, are you going to are you going to send out the invite for the executive session? It's on the calendar, but it's if you need to email, I'll go to the calendar. I'll go to the yeah, calendar. Yeah. That's fine. Okay, so 2.15, we will return in executive session. Thank you, everybody.